Uh, just Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. One more time, try it for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. Okay, and welcome to episode number 61 of Shockwaves. I'm one of your hosts, Rob Galuzzo. I'm sitting here with Mr. Elric Kane. Hey, how's it going? Good, man. What'd you do to Turk? What? <laughs> What'd you do? We tied him up. He's in the closet yeah. in the corner. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, I don't know. Oh, he gave me shit about liking the Dark Tower, so I, I, uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't think he's up. probably alone. Didn't know no, when to shut up. No, we're going to get to that. Also, <laughs> Rebecca McKendry is with us. Hello. Hello, Becca. How are you? Doing well. Doc. Excellent. Doctor? Doc? Doctor? Doctor? Doc. Are we still talking about haven't doctor? called me that in like a it's year. Like it's been a year. We forgot. We forgot. That's yeah. okay. It's well, okay. I'll you know. let it slide. Uh, so welcome back to the show. Ryan is obviously not with us uh, this week, but he will return next week. However, Exploitation Month continues. Mm -hmm. uh, we got two really fantastic guests uh, coming later uh, in the show. And a whole bunch of titles you have never heard of. I guarantee no matter how savvy you are, that you have not heard of at least one thing that we oh, say yeah. today. Yes, usually when, they, that, <laughs> when, when somebody from Bleeding Skull is on, we yeah. are uh, stumped. Yeah, yeah there's at least one title. Weird shit. So yeah, so there's some good stuff coming up, and obviously we're going to talk about what we've seen lately. Mm -hmm. um, but really, you know, we we uh, um, to bring it up off the top of the show, the last episode we recorded uh, again was a little bit earlier than usual. Um, so in the interim, unfortunately. Um, really sad to hear that uh, one of our listeners and supporters um, named uh, Dustin Pace has passed away. Uh, very talented artist, uh, died at 33, uh, very abruptly. And um, he was uh, he was with his wife Tiffany at uh, Texas Frightmare and uh, came and talked to us and hung out at the actual live uh, show that we did. He was absolutely amazing. And yeah, so really, fun. really talented uh, kid and um, really sweet person. We, you know, we had a couple of conversations over the weekend. And uh, obviously, if you look at our group photo, we did it after we did the Texas Frightmare episode. We had everybody that was wearing a Shockwave shirt come up and do a group photo with us. And Dustin's right there in the middle. And um, I was just really, uh, you know, it, it's one of us. And uh, I'm, I'm really sad about it. And obviously, our thoughts go out to Tiffany, his wife, and um, and the family. And uh, this episode is dedicated to uh, Dustin. Um, Duddy in Motion. Duddy in Motion. On Twitter. Yep. And some, uh, some, a bunch of people who, you know, knew him and interacted with him specifically on Twitter, uh, which he was one of the positive guys on Twitter. That's the thing. One of the guys who would actually try to cheer up your day. Yes. Uh, unlike so much of the misery on there. Uh, and, uh, somebody has started, I think it was on uh, Mike D at Splat House. I'm not sure. One of, one of them, uh, yeah. started a, you know, a GoFundMe. Uh, it's a GoFundMe. Yeah. GoFundMe. Yeah. To, you know, to help out because there's, you know, this, this came very suddenly yeah. uh, in their lives and they were not ready for it. And, uh, you know, would, it'd be great if anyone is out there who can help. Uh, check something their way. We don't usually do things like this, obviously. Yeah, but, but in but this case, you know, it's, it meant something. He was, uh, personal he was to part us. of the family. Yeah, and uh, we, I think we posted the links to the GoFundMe, but we'll we'll reshare them this weekend after this episode airs, so that if you're able to help out a little bit, then uh, please do. Yeah. You know? So this one's for you. Uh, all right. So the latest horrors. Here we go. Yeah. 
You want me to kick it off with uh, my controversial pick? Yeah, because you <laughs> are the only one of I'm us the who minority. saw Dark Tower. But, and the only one on Earth who sits like <laughs> that's, that's no, no, not true. But I've, it is on I know Twitter. At least five people. Well, Twitter's not real. Uh, but life, you go first on of Twitter to bitch. That's yeah. what you're supposed to do while you're there. Well, here's the thing. Okay, so I went to see the Dark uh, the Dark Tower. Having and, read it or not. I'm no, and that's okay. the th- that's the thing, is I am not um I'm not just gonna say I'm not a fan. It's just, you know, what are they? There's seven novels. Yeah, they're big it, there's a lot of novels. I could just right. that's part of King's World that I could never get into. So in theory, this movie is for me. Somebody right. that doesn't know the source material, that just wants a really easy way in, yeah. uh, at a brisk 90 minutes. Yeah. And uh and not knowing it, I loved it. I thought it was fine. I thought it was a fun, entertaining film. Everybody's great in it. Mm-hmm. It comes down to a simple, I mean, look, I don't know how intricate the stories are. So maybe if you're into the books, you are, maybe there's much more better things they could have picked to put into this one particular movie. Mm-hmm. But as far as being completely oblivious to it, it is um, a straightforward good versus evil. And Can you put yourself on the other shoe? Because oh, I haven't seen it, so I have no opinion at all. But why the negative backlash for, from the non King readers, what do you think I, that's coming from? I've it? been trying to figure that out, but the honest truth is I don't know because, I mean, I think a lot of it, it I hate to say this, but I think there is actual, um, I don't want to call it Twitter mentality, mm. but the second something comes out, because everyone started like attacking me, like, well, but you didn't like The Mummy, and how can you defend this? It's like, that is apples and oranges. Mm-hmm. Like, there is not an original thing in The Mummy. Mm. Like, The Mummy is a, stu- like, just you could tell it is a... Right hodgepodge movie of just all these other ideas and other movies that i love whereas the dark tower like yeah definitely hints at other things in stephen king's world but i loved that that was kind of fun to me and here's the thing where's my phone uh joe madry is a good friend of mine and he is kind of a king expert right he's the one that has done all the pieces for blumhouse.com that revolve around um uh anything stephen king related when it comes to the books i don't know anybody that knows them more Mm -hmm. thoroughly and he also loved it. And I remember when, when he got out of it and we were talking about it, uh, I brought his text up just so I could bring it. He's like, I'm glad you liked it. He's like, it resonated with me emotionally for two levels. One, the father and son stories. And two, the need for Jake to believe in and find other worlds. And to me, I'm like, what more do you want? And It does change my feeling hearing that Joe likes it in the sense because he is somebody – who I would have thought wouldn't have liked it given his expertise. Well, the point is, it's not the mess that everybody says it is. Like, right. it is if you had, if there was no internet and you just saw it blindly yeah. on, you know, because that's the thing is right now we're on a King resurgence. Right. And so to me, at least as a movie, as a quick 90 minute movie about just, you know, a gunslinger that fights monsters and is after the man in black, like, it's cool. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was cool. And, you know, they referenced that the kid has The Shining. So it's like I get all excited. I'm like, oh, this is totally cool to me. Like this totally feels like like if we were in the 90s again where we were getting all these King movies, it would totally fit in line with that. And it's not it's not a mess at all. It's it's a totally thoroughly entertaining movie. Now, I know people don't like it. And again, I don't know what the story is behind that. Maybe it's too bland for them. Maybe they just think it's straightforward. But here's the thing. Entertainment, you know, does it entertain you? Entertainment could be a lot of things. Uh, I would love an intricate, dense movie based on the source material, sure. But it's it's just sometimes I like just a popcorn movie, and that's yeah. all it is to me. And it was funny because for, you know my birthday passed in between episodes, and uh, Ryan got me the Art of the Dark Tower movie, and he, he was like handed to me like it was a joke, and I was like, dude, this is awesome. <laughs> wow. I, like, I actually appreciate it. I was like, no, I actually well, I love these art <laughs> books. Yeah, yeah. So he got it as a joke, and I was like, joke's on you because I liked the movie, that's and I think funny. this book is great. Wow. So that's just my two cents. Right. Uh, take it or leave it. But I don't I'll, think it's I'll a wait, mess. I'll wait for you know on demand, but I will watch it. Yeah, yeah. and I think it did well enough. And I I know the 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 plan is to do a series now as uh-huh. a prequel. Oh yeah, they're, they're, or something like that. But I yeah, I thought it was cool, and I hope they continue, especially with uh, with those those actors in those roles. Mm. I love Idris yeah. Belda in anything. He's great. He's anything. great. Anything. He's uh-huh. great. And you know what? Uh, the the last thing I'll say is not even a it's not a spoiler, but if there is a gun, if there is a sort of bordering on Western movie with a gunslinger in it. As long as he shoots a lot of people with <laughs> in the third act in an amazing action sequence, then I'm satisfied. And you get that. You okay. get to see okay. him kick ass as the gunslinger. I'm game. Yeah. So to me, I'm like, that's all I want out of this movie. Right. So that's that's my two cents. Anyway, what'd you guys say? Nice. 
Um, I, because we've been doing exploitation month, I've been on an exploitation kick um, and considering, and I don't want to drag the whole room down, but considering um, all of the turmoil that happened last weekend, I revisited Billy Jack, which is not a horror film exactly. It is an exploitation film. And I will say it is a rape revenge film straight up. Mm, Um, So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that one, but I will say I had seen that when I was a kid rewatched it in the 90s and been like, oh my God, this is so dated. And I rewatched it again two nights ago and I cried. Hmm. It is like so it changes good the now times, yeah. and so topical and you're watching it. And I mean, it's from the late 60s and you're watching it now and you're like, dude, nothing's changed. Like we've not gone anywhere. <laughs> um, so I won't spend time on it, but I will say see Billy Jack if you have not seen it. But then in addition to that, I watched a couple other exploitation movies like Burial Ground. Yes. Um, which, okay, so Peter Burial Bark. Ground. I had <laughs> sworn wow, like Burial Ground and I know we've talked about this kind of phenomenon on the show before where I swear I'd seen Burial Ground. So when that fancy Blu-ray came out a couple of months ago, I was like, I've seen Burial Ground. I'll watch it again some night when I don't have anything else to watch. And this movie that I'm confusing Burial Ground with, I have no idea what it is. It had zombies in it. There was something about voodoo. There were people trapped in a cabin. And that, it had a moon. They kept looking at the moon. Um, And that is what I thought Burial Ground was. And I still have no fucking clue what movie I thought it was. Sounds like a zombie ripoff, like a zombie, something like that. It was something Italian and it was like a zombie ripoff. But I remember it had a voodoo angle to it anyway. And it wasn't that exciting. So I was like, eh, I'll watch it when I can. So this weekend I wasn't doing anything. I put in Burial Ground. Holy fucking shit. I had never seen that movie before. (laughs) As soon as the little, um, the the weird looking kid shows up, I was like, I've definitely never seen that before. That's a because man, baby. I have. I would never forget <laughs> One that. One of the craziest performance you'll see. Yeah. Oh my god, that movie went to places. I mean, the zombies were cool. I felt bad for the maggots that were clearly glued into place yeah. and like writhing to get off their faces. But oh my god, that film went places that I was like, and you knew it was coming too. Um, see, I've only seen it on VHS, and so I, oh, I, I really have to, have to see this. See oh, my gosh, yeah. you have to see the Because I always really liked it, but it's one of those films I can't imagine what it would look like in the like, HD. And you, it has this crazy shocking moment. This, it's, absolutely, it's unlike anything else you've yeah. seen. And you know that the film is going there, and then it does, and you're just like, oh, my God, this is so bananas is yeah, the only way is, I can describe it. It is a work of art. I will say that. And uh, bless Severin Films for – restoring this thing in all its glory. Yes. So if you've not seen 1981's Burial Ground, please check out Severn Films' um, fancy Blu-ray edition. It is amazing. Uh, I saw a new film in the movie theaters uh, that, hold on to your hats, kids, has Uh-oh. a cat, unintentional Kathy's Curves reference. What? What? In no a little movie way. called Annabelle 2. <gasps> there is a direct... Oh, I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen, I haven't it, seen yet. it yet either. I don't want to bring you guys down, but... That Pony Smasher knocked it out of the fucking park. That's what I heard. Like, Everybody anyway, said it's I've seen so some people good. on Twitter being negative, and it, it kind of shocks me because I saw it with Dick, and I put it up there right under. For me, it goes in that universe just right under Conjuring 1. Uh, but You go, David On the story side, it's okay. Like, it's a pretty good story. On a directorial side, he is taking – my favorite gags that he did in his various shorts yeah. and has made them into entire set pieces oh, in a feature yeah. film. And there is a couple, I mean, I got to say sequence for sequence. There's about, I'd say five or six sequences, like horror sequences in this film that are just like absolutely wonderful. Like you're in the hands of someone who is just completely playing the gag and like uh, pulling you in. And then there's the cool thing, and I won't give any spoilers here, is my my trepidation, not not for him, uh, a film by uh, David Zamberg, but my trepidation, I, I really hated more or less the first one. The only scene like everyone I liked was the scene in the middle in, in the elevator that yes. everyone talks about uh, James Wan having directed. Mm-hmm. But it did nothing for me as a doll movie. It didn't, it didn't capture the creepy essence of the part in Conjuring yeah. that is excellent. This movie uh, outdoes that part of The Conjuring to me. It really nails the doll, but what it does... So surprisingly to me, as somebody went to go see this late at night going, how will he maintain something with a doll is that there's a lot more to it than just a doll in terms of creature ideas and monster stuff. So if you're on the fence because you're like, oh, it's a doll movie, it really is a lot bigger than that. And that surprised me. And I loved where it went on a horror level. So whenever I would read after I saw with Dick and we both turned to each other and like, 
that just like the guy just totally knocked it like this is like getting an opportunity and hitting a complete grand slam to me wow. in terms of craft especially uh but when i would start reading twitter and people go uh, you know it's not, not of course again we're talking about twitter but if somebody had a reaction of like oh dumb not scary it's like really like what do you go to a movie theater for because to me as a movie theater experience that it's, i love being played i love somebody being in the hands of someone who actually knows how to build mm -hmm. a sequence and getting that sequence. So, it, and it's also cool because we, you know, we got to meet him and he's a super nice guy. So it's, it's always cool when you're not lying and bullshitting someone <laughs> that they actually nailed it. I, I really can't say enough. To me, like, I mean, it's a funny. fun movie. You, you know? just said it like with, with people's reactions to that in the dark tower, it's like, what do you want? Yeah, what do you I don't want? understand. <laughs> yeah. What do people want out of movies these days? But th this one, I think I, I, I'll be excited to hear what everyone thinks on, on that level. But it, it, it really, it's like I, I could build, I could see a universe of different things spinning off from things that I saw in that movie. Then yeah. I'd be like, oh, I could sure watch a whole movie about that character, you know? Yeah. And you uh, ask what they want, Rob. I think they want to go online and bitch. Yeah. I guess. I think that's kind of, you know, know, regardless, I think that there's there's definitely kind of a nice but, but And the reason why that. I think it's cool that it's coming from me before you guys is because I feel like, you know, I'd say, Rob, you're probably the target in time, like taste that you would really like this movie. Yeah, I, th I feel like I'm as like the outsider uh, in terms, maybe in terms of our taste for this kind of movie. And yet I totally loved it. And it hits all those things that the reason I go to conjuring those movies is because I want to not sit back in judgment. I just want to like go on a ride. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and James is such a good craftsman. He takes you on that. This is the first time of any of the sequels directed by anyone but James that it delivers on that same level. You know, it's similar reminiscent obviously to what Mike Flanagan was able to do in Ouija too but the difference is I think Ouija is such a limited uh, thing like yeah. he's doing a lot with a little yeah uh, and I didn't really like where the film kind of ends in that the act this one does does the opposite he's he, you know dolls are you know obviously there's a whole history of why dolls creep us the fuck out and he just doubles down on that and then takes it to a whole new place so for me it was a lot more even even more effective than what Ouija 2 was able to do I, oh, really, okay. I really yeah, I'm, I gotta see it. I'm totally yeah, yeah. on board yeah uh, so that was the new film I saw I had a couple other ones but I'll wait till we circle back. Uh, I just got one. Well, I got, yeah, I got one Blu-ray recommendation for you. And it's something that you talked about quite a while ago, probably on Killer POV. Mm -hmm. And it's a little movie called Amsterdam. I actually oh, think it was still on this Dick show, but Moss. yeah, yeah. It could have been. But this was something that I believe a listener gave to you. Yes, or Jake us, is or, Samhan that's from it, yeah. uh, uh, Trivia. Mm -hmm. yes. So it was, this, it was recent, like a few, couple months ago, before the Blu-ray. All right. And so, previously, the only way that you could find this is Shameless, Shameless which is a Yellow, UK company, yeah. had put out a region two DVD and right. so you had to like have special stuff to watch it well the mighty uh, Bill Lustig who is yeah. a big fan of uh, this director uh, Dick Mass has putting uh, this comes out uh, at the end of the month I believe on August 29th fits in perfectly um, to today's topic oh my god it's it's a it's so Amsterdam and he's also doing his other film The Lift that's the one I want to see I have not seen, seen The Lift yet no, uh, I was talking about it. it with Rob before that the one's movie. coming getting this treatment in October right. but let me tell you something Amsterdam is one of those gems that I absolutely freaking loved and so so much so that well first of all look so it takes place in Amsterdam yeah so there's crazy. there's all these canals that like run through the city and it's a slasher movie where a diver <laughs> uses the canals to like jump out of the canal and kill people but it also opens and like then, from a Jaws perspective oh totally you it's think like it a POV shot show, like, I don't you know? understand what's happening here it opens with like a POV shot but then that's what's revealed I guess like he his first victim's like this hooker on the street yeah. like that gets like dumped out of a car and then just like he comes like when the the visual of seeing a diver come out of the water of a canal oh, yeah. and then stab her to death, you're like, what if I watch it? But it has one of the greatest body reveals ever, right at the start of that movie. Oh, yeah. that oh, it's one of I my was, favorite scenes I've ever. Rob seen. Was, put it up yes, online. It's brilliant. I was brilliant. so excited. So I shared it in our yeah. our Shockwaves group and on Twitter and stuff. But literally, just 15 seconds of it just was amazing. so amazingly yeah. directed, where basically this body is hanging, and then a a tour boat goes like through it yeah. with the so, glass. Uh, oh my ceiling. god the glass ceiling it's so her body is just yeah so it's really great and the whole movie delivers i really love the characters and um some of the kills and and then even the reveal was just so bad shit that i was like this movie this is a gem so kudos to you blue underground you guys have to see this one tons of extra features on it it's also i don't know if, if you got to see a dubbed version or what but i watched the original Dutch um I think it was a dubbed version I yeah think. no I watched it with the original Dutch um dialogue and subtitles cool and I mean it looks it looks fantastic also 
very rare that you see in the third act a fucking boat chase like yeah. two yeah. boats like literally the yeah, cop it's like this director. one and striking distance oh my and that's God. all yeah, that's true. I like striking distance I love striking too. Too. it's striking a distance. very it's a very long the the killer and and the cop are having this giant boat chase through the canals and it's just pretty it's just spectacular Police just, Academy 5 has a boat chase the, no but it, it's got nothing it on Amsterdam it does not have anything Dick, on Dick Amsterdam Dick didn't make it yeah. no exactly so the this Amsterdam. gets my strongest recommendation right, cool. Amsterdam is wonderful I will watch it again on Blue for sure oh yeah oh yeah um, uh, my last one for the night is 1990, The Bronx Warrior, um, which was made in 1982. Huh. So he really only gave eight years for the world <laughs> to go to shit. Um, the, the guy who, and I'm going to chew on his name here, Enzo Castellari, oh, yes. Yes. Castellari, um, directed this. And so I've always loved the Bronx Warrior films. And so I'm kind of, I'm now going to go back tonight and watch the second one. Yeah. And, these, uh, these are all put up by Blue Underground as well. I they believe, were. Yeah. And uh, I picked these up at a recent convention where they were set up at. And yeah, I'm, I'm super psyched to rewatch these. These were warrior ripoffs um, where they have like little factions of interesting gangs. Like in this one, if you remember correctly in Warriors, they had like the baseball players in the mines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this one, they have um, a tap dancing gang. There is their gang, which is all bikers. Um, and then they also have one that I thought was lepers. I think they call themselves the scavengers, but they have like shit stuck to their faces and they're wearing <laughs> rags. I was like, oh, they're the lepers. And then their rival gang are these roller skating guys in these like crazy like disco pads, but they're called the zombies for some reason. Mm. And it's got this plot of this girl who is supposed to inherit this ammunition company is like running away and she runs to the Bronx, which is called No Man's Land um, by 1990. Like the whole thing, it's lawless, it's crazy. And the guy guy who plays the head of the biker gang is this guy named Trash. And he is this Italian hunk with incredibly long arms. And Mark uh, Gregory, he's got like a baby face. Yeah, he's got this like pouty lips and like huh. a chiseled chest and this like crazy um, hair metal hair. And uh, he he takes her under his wing. And then there's this other gang um, headed by Fred Williamson. Yes. Oh, wow. That, uh, wow, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's crazy. They have the most awesome cars in the movie. Actually, most of the movie is your pretty standard kind of city siege. I'll even say it's almost, it functions like a rape revenge movie where um, the rival gang kidnaps the girl and then the the trash in his gang has to go get her. And then in the meantime, like one of his gang betrays him and goes off to one of the other gangs and tries to like, you know, tell him where he'll be so they can kill trash. And anyway, so it functions very much like a revenge film. Um, but the best scene in the movie by far is within the couple of minutes, there's this guy playing this drum solo on this pier. And he has like a full drum kit and he's just sitting on this pier outside of the Bronx playing this amazing drum solo. And then it pans over and there's this body on a spike next to him and then the whole gang pulls up and then friend Williamson's gang pulls up and they have um, rival gang banter back and forth while this drum solo <laughs> continues through the whole no, fucking it's scene. It's crazy. It's yeah. amazing. It's, it's basically the Warriors is the main one, but it's an Italian knockoff of the Warriors part, a little escape from New York kind of yeah, because it takes place in an apocalyptic New York. Yeah. Uh, maybe Road Warrior too. Uh, yeah, like they're trying to like, yeah. And they're there was, basically pulling from all those. There was a, a whole subgrouping of films that yeah, came out that were about like you know you can't fight your way through Bronx. It's the worst place on earth. Like Tenement was in there. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, this one is definitely a gem of the collection. So yeah. check they, out the Bronx Warrior. And I'm gonna watch. Yeah, 1990. The follow up is Bronx Warrior 2000, which I will be watching tonight and reporting on next week. Well, yeah, there's a. It's technically a trilogy, but not really. From what I hear, the sequel is Escape from the Bronx, mm -hmm. which is the one that Blue Underground put out, and then the third one that's not really connected, but it was released at the same time, is called The New Barbarians. So yes. those are sort. Technically, it's only two movies, but they tack on that third one as if mm. it's supposed to be kind of part of a trilogy. I'll stand. Anyway. Point, I researched. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. It's just going to stand point with the New York film, but you, you know, finish it. I, I was going to quickly say that I researched the lead, the good-looking baby face oh, guy yeah, with the long arms. He um, now lives in Italy. He doesn't like to be contacted for interviews, and from what I could tell, he's like a life coach now. His his bio was something like, "I help people improve their lives." So I'm just going to say, life coach. Nice. All right. Good for him. Yeah. Uh, my New York film uh, is, that has been sitting on my shelf since Texas Frightmare. I've been dying to see it on Blu-ray. I got to see Brain Damage. No, I uh, oh, yes. I got to watch Arrow. And, and it was really glorious to see it like this because that's a movie I've only seen dark, you know, on a VHS. And it's such a creative 
funny, strange little movie that it's one of those movies that when you watch it, you're like, it's hard to believe some guy made this movie. Mm -hmm. Like it's just from his imagination came up with these weird ideas yeah. uh, and this creature and somehow it works. It's one of those movies that probably shouldn't work at all. Like it should like, like basket case makes more sense to me in some ways why that works. Mm -hmm. This one I feel like should just totally fall apart. I didn't, haven't gotten through the extras yet, but I really enjoyed watching it. It looks just so great. The trippy sequences with the water and stuff just look just, it, and it doesn't look blue. bad. Like it doesn't, I was worried it might ruin, ruin Almer and it doesn't, it actually really, and kind of improves his color and everything. It's, it's a pretty remarkable. So I'm not going to go too in depth on that one. Cause I feel like most of you know about Brandon. Yeah. I did see, um, and the other one we were double featuring and I'd never seen this film. You guys probably have a uh, trick or treats. The one about the little boy being babysat on Halloween. And he's oh a no. Trick or treats. But this trick is the treats. one I think like code red, maybe put this code red, put oh, this out. I D have not seen this. The Dick Grinnert uh, is a big fan of this one. And, and, um, trick or treats. trick or treats. It's not from Sammy Kerr, 80s. not Sam Hain. No. Trick or and treats. it's not the one with the heavy metal That's it's not Sammy with, yeah. uh this one um uh you know halloween completists <laughs> absolutely should watch it i put it above haunted ween for sure wow okay. <laughs> uh, i just found it kind of um it kind of kind of redundant uh david carradine is in it at the for one scene at the start and he's really kind of fun and charismatic at the start is uh and he's he's uh a magician and they're they're going away to vegas and this their their son is going to be left at home with a babysitter but it's a really strange strange movie and it was you could tell that it was made like as a true indie uh by the kind of the family who are put i think it's gary graver yes. uh, who was the last guy to shoot norris and wells movie he was like the last dp to work with wells uh late in wells's life and uh it's you know it, i would watch this movie happily again on halloween because i love movies set at halloween and it's got a couple really cool sequences but it's also one of those movies where oh the guy's getting out of the insane asylum and he's going to try to make it home to, to torment you and you can, there's no real scares in this movie but it's kind of some fun magic gags with the kid pretending he's dead but they also outweigh outstay their welcome real quick uh there's a lot of kind of obnoxious acting but i could also imagine that this and i'm sure i don't even have to probably even say this a lot i bet you in our say our shockwaves group alone there are probably people who this is literally their favorite movie like this <laughs> it has that kind of quality where you're going to be someone who loves this movie because of nostalgia or when you mm -hmm. saw it. Uh, but just seeing it in the context, I saw it, I was kind of like, I was a little bored and a little uh, unmoved by it. But it, because Halloween movies are, there just aren't enough of them set on Halloween. I say it's totally worth it on that level. Uh, see it for yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the Code Red DVD brulee is still around. I was um, going to say, I was like, you got to say brulee. Brulee. The brulee. The brulee. You, you always got to say brulee. Uh, but, you know, for completists, and, and, and write to me to tell me I'm an idiot because you love this movie because I bet you do, uh, somebody out there. But, you know, uh, I could, it could use more Gene uh, Simmons for me. Yeah, last, <laughs> I, last I checked, I think it was, no, it's not on there anymore. It was available through Screen Archives, which usually okay. carries a lot of the yeah, Code Red yeah. stuff. But if you, if you hunt around, you'll probably find yeah. it. So. But, uh, you know, it's somebody's favorite movie. Yeah. <laughs> Just no, I want right to see today. that one. I'm going to save it for uh, Yeah, save Halloween. it for Halloween for sure. I think I, think I would rewatch it again. Anything else, Becca? I watched um, this one. So after everyone knows that I love those movies where they stuff everybody in one room and then oh, yeah. they have to figure out why they're there. <laughs> so um, I did a round at Trivia last yeah, month. That's terrible. Which it was awesome. <laughs> terrible round it was called All of These People Are in One Room Figuring Out Why They're except, There. Except she put a still of everyone uh, of this one group out in a forest and all the rest were in rooms. That's and because so all of us were like, oh, well, it must be, what was that one of uh, severance or something? Because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. And then it was something that none, it was, no one had it heard was, um, that one was My remember. Little Eye, My which little was the group of people traveling to the one. We talked about on the show. We talked about on the show. You yeah, should know, it's know that. So frustrating. Though. But anyway, so after that, um, somebody was like, "You should check out this film that's on Netflix called Circle from 2015, oh, yeah. which is a whole bunch of people in one room and this weird device in the middle that's killing one of them every couple of minutes, and they have to figure out why or how to stop it. And it was not my cup of tea. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's still I was waiting for a really big twist. And I will say that they did go some interesting places in the way that they were kind of trying to shape it. But it was not as smart as I would say if you if you would like these movies. Um, and a lot of them did kind of come post saw where they do just put five people in a room and make them figure out why they're there. Mm -hmm. Nine Dead is a really good one. Um, Fermat's Room I really liked. And uh, I would also say The Killing Room is really good. So if you like but, movies, set in one room. You know what I did see uh, Cube before, great. No, Cube, before Annabelle great. 2? That predates Saw. Uh, they showed the Saw trailer, which I hadn't oh, seen. Oh, the new Saw trailer, yeah. And, I've got, and me and Dick both looked at each other and go, 
I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, like, I, I was, was kind of surprised, man. I was really skeptical that I finally saw it. And because I was like, it looked like, okay, a, I'm in. It looked like a real movie. Yeah. yeah. And the rest of the, like, a lot of the sequels towards the end didn't stop looking. They looked like Saw movies, not real movies. This looked like right. a real movie. So even if it's not good, it looked fun. Yeah, at least mm-hmm. the scope of it um, looks kind of fun. Before, yeah. before we leave, though, I, for, I didn't even tell. I'm mean, just got to at least say this. Why I reference it's got, uh, why it's got a Kathy's curse. Oh, oh yeah. What? Oh, uh, God. There's literally a shot, and this isn't really a spoiler because it's pretty early in the movie. In Annabelle 2, where a girl is holding a portrait of a little girl who used to live there, and she goes <laughs> holds it into darkness, and the eyes glow in the exact same way it happens in Kathy's Curse. Wow. And so if David has seen Kathy's Curse, he's a living Absolutely. legend. And if yes. he's not, he just unintentionally uh, referenced one of the worst films ever made. No, so I'm either way, sure. kudos to you, David. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Uh, all righty. Uh, we are going to take a quick break and then bring our guests on. Uh, we got uh, some pretty amazing guests yeah. uh, from uh, AFCA. Yeah, AFCA, which, yeah. Is that, is that how you I guess so, right? yeah, AFCA, yeah. Yeah, American right. genre nice. film. Well, listen, the Zodiac okay. Killer is on Blu-ray <laughs> because of these know. people. Yeah. So we'll Hold get on to side. it. <laughs> are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? With ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to 100-plus job sites with just one click. Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. One more time, try it for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash shock. And we are being joined by a pair of uh, genuine cinephiles, uh, Joseph Ziemba and Brett Berg, who flashback. Brett oh. Berg was on a, an episode of Killer POV way back when, when we did United States of Horror. Yeah, yeah. the 50 States of Horror. 50 States of Horror, uh, listen to family. So uh, they are joining us uh, about a lot of things, but specifically something that I got really excited when I first heard about it a couple of years, or maybe it was about a year, and a, a year and a bit ago, I think, when somebody gave me a shirt, AGFA, which is the American uh, Genre Film Archive. So they're going to tell us a little about that to continue our exploitation love. So welcome, guys. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, how did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> to paraphrase broad, Rob. Broad question. He just goes right to the happen? punch. What <laughs> happened here? How did this happen? What so, is, uh, yeah, well, let's talk about what it is initially and where it came from because a lot of people will be familiar with things like Alamo Draft House. Yeah. But beyond that, they might not know. So what's yeah. an AGFA? AGFA is the American Genre Film Archive. It's a nonprofit sister company of the Alamo Draft House that um, Alamo CEO Tim League started in 2009. And um, the reason why it started is he uh, heard about a, a bunch of genre film prints that were being sold down south. Mm-hmm. And he thought, well, there's about 400 of those. I can get a U-Haul and I can go buy those and I can bring them back to Austin and then I'll have all these prints. And he did that all by himself. But when he got back, he had no idea what to do with them. Huh. And so he and Carrie League, which is his wife, um, decided to start the American Genre Film Archive, which is a nonprofit. And basically to house these prints and to have a place for them so that they'd be available to people um, for bookings everywhere all across the world do we know where these prints came from this, this um, collection it's somewhere down south i don't know exactly where it was sebastian was it like would know. a dude or like a, <laughs> it was a it dude like, okay yeah okay. it was a dude in a warehouse that's what i i always hear tell of these like yeah. you know so and so is having found you know 20 reels from these 1970s films that you've never yeah. seen at like a warehouse sale in Canada and things Allegedly like that. Allegedly so. it was Colonel Sanders. We don't know. <laughs> but, but it's a good image to have in your head. Dude my, down south. Clearly Colonel yeah, Sanders. My great aunt dated Colonel Sanders. What? Whoa. Yeah. Look at that. I, the I, real I one? Yeah, the real Did one. he wear <laughs> yeah. that little like stringy tie all yeah. the time? I actually have family photos of him holding me when I was a kid wow. and he was hanging out. Yeah, That's probably the, the best revelation wow. of this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> pretty good, right? <laughs> That's up there with our poltergeist story. Um, <laughs> Who t- tell me the story? And I'm not sure if it's part of the AGFA, mm-hmm. but I remember seeing the astrologer 
Mm -hmm. It's astrologist or astrologer? The astrologer, the astrologer, which was one of the craziest things I, I've seen mm -hmm. on a screen. Like pretty kind of amazing. And I know it came about kind of from a similar place, right? Uh, but didn't yeah. the film print there get discovered in the Sex Institute of the guys who did the, or is that not the case? Becca just perked up. Yeah, you know, the Sex Institute, there's actually a place in New York called, or, no, that's the Sex Museum. Mm -hmm. There's a Sex Museum. In it's New hard York. to tell because we have so much okay. at ECFA. So that one was basically found in the archive, like uh, deep, deep in the bowels of the archive. And um, that kind of led us onto the path of where AGFA is today uh -huh. by finding a movie like that, whereas we have all of these prints and people are enjoying them and they're renting them and they're playing in front of audiences, which is where they should be. Right. Um, but what can we do with AGFA that would make, what can we do, what's more that we can do, like what can we do for the cause that's going to make these movies more available? And so about a year and a half ago, um, Sebastian Del Castillo, who is the head archivist at AGFA, and I um, had this idea where what if AGFA became something bigger, not just having the prints, but what if it became an actual theatrical and home video distribution label? And um, so we went to Tim with that, and he liked the idea, and so we started doing that. And then, um, so that's kicking off, like, right now, actually. And then we also have a new theatrical distribution arm of AGFA, which is handling a lot of libraries, including AGFA, and then our friends at Severn and Vinegar Syndrome and Arrow Films. And um, that's how Brett came to be uh, working with AGFA because Brett is the theatrical sales manager of AGFA. And he is a wizard. He's the best at what he does. Amazing. And used to program, so back on our old show, used to program for CineFamily mm -hmm. and before that was a Cinephile mm -hmm. employee. And Yeah, I was one of the original uh, employees of Cinephile Video, which is next door to the New Art mm -hmm. in yeah. Santa Monica. One of the best video stores around. Um, so through going through this, you have to have, I mean, I can't imagine going through the amount of films you probably have to go watch or look through to find gems. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you obviously, I have to assume you both have, I, I mean, we've spoken before, but a deep passion for movies and also just like off beat movies, you mm -hmm. know, a big part of what we haven't revealed yet, brace yourselves, is that he was also the co-writer of Bleeding Skull. Now everyone's going fucking bat shit <laughs> at home because they know that because we talked about that like, uh, five years ago too <laughs> yeah but that's like that's awesome like i told him when he came in i'm like i know everything you have ever written for bleeding skull but you're gonna have to fill me in on your draft house position <laughs> thank you so yeah. yeah so like talk about like where your passion for like these kind of movies came from the kind of offbeat not were, necessarily were you a video store kid like the rest of us yeah absolutely attending or working at one <laughs> I, I never worked at one attending as far as far back as i could remember um i grew up in chicago and then um, in the suburb of Chicago Heights where we lived, there was a, a video store called The Video Store. Oh, and uh, that's, that was our family <laughs> video store where we, we went to rent to everything. Yeah, so I was very early on very much into these movies. And it, it just kind of like uh, as I went, I discovered new directors and new like it, it started with William Castle when I was a little kid. I remember one of my earliest memories was seeing 13 Ghosts with my dad. And um, like the lights went out in our house during a storm while we were watching it. And it was really like, oh, this is so amazing. I really loved it. Um, and then I discovered in high school Ed Wood, and that was a big turning point for me. Um, and then as the years went on, it was Doris Wishman and Herschel Gordon Lewis. Um, and then even later, um, Chester Turner, Mark and John Polonia. Like it just kept going and going and going. And so it's, it's just a lifelong love and appreciation. And, and the reason why I started Bleeding Skull in 2004 was because this love that I had, I felt that wasn't being shared throughout the world. I felt people were talking down to these movies, making fun of them. They're picking on the fat kid, which we all know what that feels like because we were all that kid mm -hmm. at some point in our lives. Um, and so that is something that was always really important to me, that these movies were elevated and they were appreciated in the same light that movies by Altman or Godard were appreciated by certain people. Um, so that was always re really important for me. But at the same time, having fun in my appreciation of these movies. So that's where it all came from. Well, does there? It's funny because when obviously we're we're all of the video store generation, and I think what what happens is you you find uh, the franchises and the well known things that you read in Fangoria, and then uh, and then you try, and then like you're on a quest. Mm -hmm. You want to find the one that nobody's ever seen before that you could tell all your friends about. And um, what's fun about Bleeding Skull? I mean, um, we did an episode with Dan Budnick in for Killer POV, our preview yeah. show, which and, is great. Yeah, and of all the episodes we did. You know, I, I like to think that our collective knowledge is pretty good. We didn't know a single title that Dan threw out. I left with a list. We were like, wow. Because um, I think we did something similar than we're than what we're going to do tonight, where you were supposed to bring a list of lesser known films. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, I'm getting like, okay, well, I think pretty sure like me and four other people have th seen this one. The stuff that Dan brought, I was like, I don't even know where to find this stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you can't. And yeah, it was amazing, his, his knowledge. But of you, these, can like, you, you can, can read about them. You can read about them. You can read about them. So I'm just curious, was the, is there a specific um, um, 
not, I don't want to say subgenre, but a specific thing that, that, um, you loved sharing with people. Like, for example, a lot of this is shot on video mm-hmm. stuff, which is very, uh, very obscure unless you yeah. rented it when it came out. Mm-hmm. So do you have a preference for some of the stuff that's been on Bleeding Skull personally? I have a preference for the movies that are very individualistic and that the ones that are the more lo-fi and out there and strange that they are the ones that feel like they're from somebody's heart in a way that they had to do it. And that's, they had to do it because that was their life. Like I have to make this movie. I can't do anything else. Like I can't bag groceries. I can't be a librarian. I can't be a mechanic. I have to make this movie. And that's what attracts me the most because I think the most interesting stories come from that, from people's creativity. Because I feel like um, when people have unleashed that in their mind, when they have, there's nothing holding them back. Like there's no one else with money. There's no one telling them what to do. That's when the most interesting things come out because there's no filter and it just goes. And the great thing about the era of Super 8 and shot on video in the 80s and 90s is that there was more of that because it was possible. It was easy for people because, I mean, you could go to a video store like Chester Turner did and have a trunk full of Tales of McQuad Dead Zone or Black Devil Doll from Hell and you could sell them to video stores and they'd put them up next to Halloween and people wouldn't know the difference. Right. Because like the cover art looks great. This looks amazing. I think I'll rent it. And they'd get home and be like, what did I just do? You know, what happened? <laughs> um, so that's what I'm most attracted to. And I think that's what fuels Bleeding Skull and, and Agfa to a certain degree because it, it kind of lines up perfectly because Agfa was always about championing, championing the obscure movies. Um, so they fit together very well. Well, you know, I also miss the commitment to renting a movie like, like you know, Tales of the, of the Quads because it's like, you, now you can stream through 800 different things. You can watch yeah. five minutes of it and be like, I don't like this. I'm not going to watch mm-hmm. it. But you went out to the video store. You paid money. You take home this thing. And no matter what, you're like, well, uh, this is the night's plan. It's We're going to watch this thing. There's some start. sort of contract being bound there. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. true. And usually by the time you get to the end of it, there's something. Mm-hmm. There's something that appeals to the money, uh, the movie lover in you. Yeah. Right? And for so. the longest time, I thought that my no longer being willing to watch things the whole way through, because now if something's on Netflix and I started and suddenly like it's got crappy sound quality or the production value is bad, I'll turn it off and find something else. For the longest time, I thought that that was because I was getting older and that I was just like, I don't have time for this type of stuff anymore. And I think that that's actually not a generational thing now. I think that that's a lot. I think most people do that regardless of their age now. Um, But yeah, when it was on video, you know, it was all I had that night. It was this or I'm going to have to go pull old home movies and watch. So yeah, I'm going to watch it no matter how bad it is. And there's a sense of comfort in that because mm-hmm. they become your friends. These movies become your special friends that you can watch over and over and over. Mm-hmm. If you feel down, it's like, oh, you could you could go watch something uplifting like, I don't know, like City Lights by Charlie Chaplin. Or you could watch, uh, I don't know, Bad Taste. And that makes you feel just as good because it's your movie. And it's something. So I think there's something really special in that, especially when you're talking about growing up with video stores. I mean, that's a huge part of it. Or even the movies on TV, I discover I did the same thing because like USA Up All Night, I used to watch Night Flight all the time. Mm -hmm. Or they used to have this Kung Fu thing on Sunday mornings, Kung Fu Theater on Sunday mornings um, where I grew up. And it was like, well, you could watch this, some kung fu movie that's probably not so great, but, you know, you could watch this or you could go watch Cartoon Express on USA. And so I always opted for the kung fu movie. And it was like a commitment. I had to see it through to the end. Uh, Before we delve into some of the stuff that you guys have been doing recently, um, I'm just curious if we could talk a little bit about um, launching Bleeding Skull Mm -hmm. as a website, Mm -hmm. you know, creating this thing. Uh, Because when did it exactly launch and what was like the web land landscape like and that you were like, this is what's going to set us different from all the other horror sites? Oh, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> it was purely based on um, my love of the movie. So it launched on January 1st, 2004. And what happened is um, I was in a band at the time and I was um, on tour and gathering all these movies at video stores because at that time, like 2002, 2003 was the golden age of finding video stores that were liquidating their stocks. It was like $1.50 a tape. So I was like filling the van (laughs) with tapes and then I'd come home and watch them all. And at the time I was a freelance designer. So I was like, I need a new website for my design work. So, and I I saw this ad in the back of a comic for Bleeding Skull, which is like you light the candle and the skull bleeds. (laughs) And um, I thought that's a great name for a design company. I'm going to do that. And I started making this portfolio site and I lost interest immediately. I was like, this is dumb. I don't like it. So I thought, um, I think uh, one day I was, uh, our band played a show like the night before Thanksgiving and I got really sick. I got the flu afterwards. And so the next day at Thanksgiving, um, I missed Thanksgiving. So I wasn't able to go hang out with my family. And so I was sitting on the couch and thinking like, oh, what can I do? I think I'll uh, watch Shriek of the Mutilated and write a review of it because it sounds like fun. And so in this total daze of feverish flu, 
um, I wrote a review of that movie and I thought it was really fun. So I decided to just start a site and start putting them up. Um, and that was it. I didn't think about it at all. And my friend at the time, RJ, um, had his own server. So he was like, I'll host this for you because at the time to get a dot com was so, so expensive. And I was like, <laughs> uphill battle. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was a good time. I had fun doing it. You know, that's why I did it. Did you write about, did you ever do writing before that? Or was that no, kind of the first? Never. Wow. Yeah, I did. Um, I did stuff in college. I took some creative writing classes in college, you know, mm-hmm. because I didn't want to take um, philosophy courses or geography courses. Um, so I did stuff like that. And when I was a kid, I wrote, I wrote comics on my own. Like I did like cracked magazine ripoffs and, you know, stuff like that. But um, never any serious. I, I still don't consider myself a writer. I would, n- I would never think that I'm a, I'm a writer. Like I write. I just, it's just something fun that I do that I like to share. So. Um, did you ever get to a point in the website where, uh, like, obviously you love to watch movies, but where you felt obligated to watch as much as humanly possible for the sake of the website? Because, mm-hmm. for example, our friend Brian Collins did horror movie a day for mm-hmm. twenty five hundred days. <laughs> when it becomes a chore, and, that's a and, lot yeah, of days. He's he's like, yeah, it, it came a point where he's like, oh my god, I would have never watched this, but I need to hit that quota for the day. So. That's Did a, you ever get to that point? <laughs> I think that's a very good question because yeah. uh, right now, Zach Carlson, Annie Choi, and I are working on the second Bleeding Skull book, uh-huh. which is Bleeding Skull, a 1990s trash horror odyssey. Ooh, boy. <laughs> so um, we each have about, I don't know, 85 to 100 reviews to do. Um, and there have been many moments where it's like, I, I can't believe, like you get, and most of these movies, like none of us have heard, either, like the three of us were like, these are this is new uncharted territory for us. And there have definitely been moments where it's like, I... I don't know if I can watch three more Todd Sheets movies. I love Todd Sheets, but I'm not sure if I can make it. But then I do. So it's like that's that's I think one of the only times. And usually um, on the site, if it's if it gets like feeling like that, I kind of like take a break or like Annie will write a review or Zach will do a review and balances out. But not generally. Um, people have asked me that at work. Like, do you ever get sick of like the Bleeding Skull movies? And I never, ever do. I've never once ever been sick of it. I took a break for like two years because like uh, life stuff, like I got divorced and I'm like, I can't watch horror movies anymore because they're a bad influence and I need to watch things that are happier. <laughs> and that was a big mistake. So I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So, I went through that right after I had kids where I yeah. was suddenly like, I really shouldn't be watching these as much. I'll limit it to just work stuff. And then immediately like, uh, I'm just like, but it's what I want to watch. Yeah. It's what I love. Why it's am I doing this to myself? I'm not rom-coms. Yeah. It's in my DNA. So I have to do it. And I love it. So. How'd you find, like, uh, especially when you're talking about the nineties ones, mm-hmm. how, how do you even find them or find out about the titles that you would don't, that you don't know about? So how does one find, are there, is it chat rooms or what kind of search are you doing? Um, so for the 90s stuff, it's been a combination of what Zach and I already had in our collections. And then going from there, reaching out to other collectors, um, friends. But Zach Carlson is probably the second greatest VHS collection I've ever seen in my life um, of all the people that I've met. Um, it's really intense. Yeah. I mean, the, the amount of depth that he has in his collection. So a lot of it came from Zach's initial you know, mountain of knowledge and tapes and then mine. And from there, it was actually um, going back to old print zines from the 80s and 90s <laughs> and looking at the ads and looking at what uh-huh. was reviewed. Um, a lot of the stuff's not on the internet yet. Um, but with Letterboxd, that's changing a lot because pretty much everything is starting to be on yeah. there. But when we started researching the book about two years ago, it was all through Alternative Cinema Magazine, Draculina Magazine, like buying old issues, Psychotronics, like buying all of those and just like noting everything that was in there and trying to find it all and reaching out to directors that directed the movies and seeing if they had copies like of stuff that we couldn't find. But um, there's still a list of about like 15 that we haven't been able to find um, that we're just like, oh, I got to get it, but it's not going to happen. But yeah. Have you discovered any like, and when I mean gems, I mean like, yeah, that's, you know, some people like things. I always champion things to people, but then <laughs> yes. but oh, it's one of my favorites, yes. but then often people, the reaction I get sometimes when they watch it is, is, oh. is not what I had. The experience I had watching things was yeah. just like magic, but then somebody will watch and go, what the hell? Oh. Uh, so I, you never know if it's going to connect, but have you discovered ones in this nineties phase mm-hmm. that you're doing where you're like, holy shit, how does somebody not know about this? Have you, yeah. Have any you found total a couple of gems that you're just like, how is this not been seen by everyone yes what are some <laughs> um okay well uh any chance i get i like to talk about mark and john polonia um who are uh extreme diy filmmakers uh-huh. who started with splatter farm in 1987 that was their first movie and they made it when they were 16 years old wow what are their names Holy again shit. mark and john polonia <laughs> john. so mark and john polonia started out making uh, super eight movies in high school And they graduated very quickly when their um, parents got a camcorder, I think, for Christmas. And they made this movie called Splatter Farm. 
And Splatter Farm to this day is one of the most extreme like experiences of like sludge shot on video. <laughs> like it's incredible and it's affecting and it's like dark and hilarious and it goes way too far. Like they're twin brothers who are the thing that I love about them is that they're always themselves. Always. Like you get you get the feeling that it was like everyone was telling them like, why are you guys doing this? But they were like, no, this is what we want to do. We love making horror movies. We love horror movies. So they just did it no matter what. And um, that's the thing that I really love about them because they're very true to themselves and following their dreams. But yeah, Splatter Farm is an experience that you'll never, ever forget. Did they they're make others titers. after they, They're oh, still yeah, they making tons. stuff. Oh. These guys yeah. have like literally dozens of films. Pralian sounds, um, Alien Predators, Pralian. That's the house I, that screamed. That's a good that's title. the one that I think I may have seen. That one's from two thousand. Two thousand. Yeah. yeah, that looks vaguely familiar. Um, but yeah, it's weird that these movies tons. still exist post two thousand. Though I feel like there's something about seventies, eighties, and nineties. Anything after that, it's like really, it's still yeah. happening. But I guess that well, would I be mean, the third book. Think <laughs> about it when you go to conventions in other, like not LA or New York. There's you always see the local filmmakers set up. Like when yeah. we go to Texas, I'm that's always true. excited to there's see like some yeah. of the filmmakers that are set up there that are only based there. Like, but I always meet and find really cool stuff like i found billy pond that way hmm. so. and you're writing a, a i've heard a big book of just all about wood chipper massacre right <laughs> <laughs> i think that could be done i think, I think it it could be. a long form 200 page interview with john mcbride oh, the world needs it i think a tv but, show that's my all-time favorite <laughs> family i think every thanksgiving i basically <laughs> post a photo of that family because there's something about that family that just looks so bizarre to me that kid is the it. best air guitar oh my gosh he's so good in that movie the, is Wood Chipper, would a title like that be in your Bleeding Skull? Or uh, Wood Chipper one? Massacre is in the first book. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It had to be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. a no that one, Now, does it ever bother you to watch SOV? Because I, as much as I appreciate it mm-hmm. now when I try to watch SOV stuff, mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, this is a bit taxing on mm-hmm. the eyes. Do you st- do you have that problem? Or does you mean it- newer shot on video stuff or even in old, the 80s? like in the 80s. Like there's the some 80s. that I say that they covered it well. Like mm-hmm. I, I, some of the ones that we've watched, I'm, I'm like, it's tolerant. But then other ones of like okay that the visuals are on this are kind of giving me a headache yeah i think it depends on your your personal tolerance for that stuff it's the same thing with um like a movie like wreck you mm-hmm. know if someone watches a movie like wreck mm-hmm. and they're like this is making me sick i can't watch more than five minutes of this but for someone else it's like oh i love it it's like being on a roller coaster so i think it just depends on your personal like aesthetic like what you like because for me the shot on video is really appealing because it's very urgent mm-hmm. it's uh, another thing i was saying about how it's these people have the most interesting stories when it's about them basically. And you can't get more interesting than home movies to me and like figuring out these people's stories and why are they doing this? And um, so I really like that aesthetic of shot on video. It's just very urgent and very real to me. It's very erratic. Like that's yeah. the one thing because, and I guess it is a lot of the technology where it is mostly shoulder held mm-hmm. and there is no kind of motion control on it. So yeah. every single time I watch it, it's like worse than found footage for me where I always leave kind of feeling like I'm, little nauseous on yeah, this one. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Not but all then, of them, though, like yeah. Sledgehammer. No, well, no, <laughs> yeah. Not some all of them are pure magic, though. Yeah, some okay. of them are absolutely amazing, mm-hmm. I do have to say. Um, regarding Bleeding Skull, you mentioned there's going to be a, a second book mm-hmm. coming out. What about the, the first book? Because I know a lot of people have, have been searching for at least a paperback mm-hmm. edition mm-hmm. of it, and it's very hard to get and yeah. very expensive. Um, with the new book coming out, is there a possibility of a, a reprint of the original, or what, what's uh, the status with that? I would say probably not. I don't think there is. I think um, for me personally, I think the new book was a sign of what we were doing at a time. And it's a representation and a document of that era of Bleeding Skull. Right. And now Bleeding Skull is what it is now. So uh, I just always, it's something with me. I just prefer to keep moving forward. I just like doing more, like doing more new stuff. Um, So probably not, I would say. All right. And And how how far along are you on Bleeding Skull too, the second uh, we're pretty far along, actually. It's uh, going to be released by Fanographics in 2018, and our uh, our deadline for the manuscript is in March. So our internal deadline for being done with the writing is December, and then Annie is going to edit the whole thing. So we're pretty close. Annie has like six reviews left, and we all started with like 85. Oh my god! Um, so she's really close. I have 12 left, and Zach has a few more than us. But uh, we're getting close. Yeah. All right. Well, to well, listeners, don't snooze, or you'll, yeah. you'll miss out on this one too. Are, are there any films like in terms of your tolerance when you're watching that volume of these kinds? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like we're talking about gems, and you don't even have to name titles because uh-huh. we're not a hating on cinema show, as we mm-hmm. told you before. But are, were, are there somewhere even now you're you're just physically tested to get oh, yeah. through it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There's there's some that are just. You know, you can tell that there was a lot of heart in the person that's trying to make something, you know, like get yeah. something done. But you can only go so far when you're making, you know, a slasher movie that's set in a haunted house that has no script. 
and all of your friends in it and you got to fill up 70 minutes and it's yeah. like there's nothing it's like i'm yeah. trying to look for something and there's nothing here it's like it's it's pretty taxing but you know those are a uh, few and far between there's i That's mean there's good. not there's not that many that are just like oh god like i'm i'm gonna die i'm gonna put my head in the yeah. i can't do it uh but uh yeah so if for the most part they get by a lot on their heart you know, it's yeah. like you can always tell that like there's so much going into it. So you kind of feel like empathy while you're watching the movie. Uh, let's talk about some of the uh, yeah, actor I, titles. I got to yeah. bring up Zodiac Killer because. All right. So I, I missed this when it was on a double DVD or a DVD double feature with something weird. I, I mm-hmm. remember the title and I remember seeing it. But what happened was I went to my friend Scott's house one night and, and uh, I guess he DVR'd it off of uh, Turner Classics. Yeah, yeah. Sam, that's right. Sir. And, and literally he's like, dude, I watched like five minutes of this and then stopped it and knew I had to wait for you to get here. <laughs> He's like, I cannot experience this alone. And I feel like you're the one that's going to appreciate it. And, and I mean, and obviously it was, it was probably the restoration that you guys did because it looked amazing oh, thanks. for what it was. And we were I like, I think I talked about it on the show. I was pretty speechless by this movie. I didn't, I didn't, there was so much about it. I also love uh, Fincher's Zodiac. It's like mm-hmm. my yeah, favorite yeah. Fincher movie. Yeah. So to have those two movies, <laughs> I was kind of like, wow. And then I realized that this was going to be part of a Blu-ray release. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about Zodiac Killer. When did you guys discover this movie? Because one of the most exciting things was after the fact, reading about it and then finding out, oh, this was actually made in an attempt to capture the Zodiac yes. Killer. So when did you guys stumble on this one? Uh, for me, it was early 2000s. It was a something weird VHS. Um, mm-hmm. They had first put it out. And that was at the time when um, I, I discovered something weird towards the late 90s when I went to college. Um, and they had uh, that was like a newer one that they put out. They put it on VHS and then that triple feature DVD came out. And that's how I discovered it. And um, with something weird, it's more about um, the brand of something weird rather yeah. than the individual titles. It's mm-hmm. like I will watch I, at the time. You know, it's like anything with the something weird logo, I'm going to watch it, you know, even if it just ends up being an hour of people go-go dancing naked. Like, I will watch it. I've seen that one. I know. There's, I, there's I really have. There's yeah. many. Yeah, yeah. There used to be a VOD channel. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. That They had a something weird VOD channel oh when I lived in New York City. Mm-hmm. And it was literally just like, uh, sometimes they would have movies on there, like you would watch full stuff, like Queen of a Thousand Nights or stuff like that. And then mm-hmm. other times it would just be reels and loops mm-hmm. of like yeah. people go-go dancing. And then they take a top off and then it would end. And then another one We need start. more channels like that. It was, it was <laughs> a great I, that's channel, so much better though. than Netflix. Like, I just don't. <laughs> I love that idea. Um, yeah, so I discovered that movie, and that was one of the ones um, like Dracula the Dirty Old Man or Double Agent 73, where it's the ones from. That's so, a Wishman. Yeah, it is. Um, it was one of the top tier something weirds. It was for me, it was like, this is a classic something weird title. Um, so when um, Mike Franey unfortunately passed away in 2014, um, at the time, uh, it was kind of unsure what was going to happen with Something Weird in the archive. And Lisa Petrucci, who is now the president of Something Weird, at the time we were, started talking with her about, you know, we are a nonprofit, we're AGFA, we would love to help. Um, we did like a marathon in memoriam for Mike in Austin at the Alamo. And it just kind of, we started talking more after that. And that's the way that, like the partnership kind of worked out and AGFA and Something Weird. And when we got the initial list from Lisa of the movies that were available to re- re-release together, um, all I was thinking was like, please let Zodiac Killer be on the list. Like, please let it be there. And then I went to the bottom of the spreadsheet right away and it was there. And I was so happy, so happy. <laughs> um, so uh, that's how we ended up making that the, the initial release for Agfa and Something Weird. So tell people, I mean, Rob, Rob knows because he, he had to write about this. <laughs> but, but tell people a little about what was happening behind the scenes of Zodiac Killer. Because I, I saw it on TCM before I'd heard your announcement. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know there was any, like, there's no hoopla about why this is a special film. I just yeah. recorded TCM because it's like, oh, Zodiac Killer, that sounds crazy. And so I'm watching it kind of speechless, uh, especially about the wig. The, well, the one wig, the guys, it's kind of an amazing two Uh But, like, the stories behind it just add this whole other layer to what you're watching. Mm-hmm. Uh, so can you just talk a little bit? about what you guys discovered through, I don't know, researching it? Yeah, absolutely. Mostly it all came from Tom Hansen, the director who we tracked down um, because of Chris Pagiali with Temple of Schlock who had tracked him down before. But the thing that's insane about Zodiac Killer is that I think when um, most of us find ourselves in a position where our community is threatened by someone who is killing people, mm. you know, is on the rampage, we'd probably just close our doors and watch the news and make sure that our family is safe. Um, but in the case of Tom Hansen, he took it 20 steps further and said, you know what, 
um, this guy's a threat to everyone around here. I'm going to catch this son of a bitch. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to make a movie so that when I show the movie, he comes to the movie because he's such a fame whore. Uh, and then we will jump this guy and catch him. So that was his whole intention yes. of making the movie was just to lure this guy yes, to the movie. Yeah, and he wanted to make a million dollars off of it so he could make more movies. So it was nice. pure business. Like <laughs> no art whatsoever involved in the Zodiac Killer. Like, okay, so did it work? <laughs> He thinks it did. He says that it did. I don't know. I mean, I can't say. I mean, obviously, no one ever found out who the Zodiac yeah. Killer was, so maybe he's still out there. I, I bet you he's, uh, he came. I bet he's, his intention is correct. I bet that no matter what, whoever that killer was, they mm-hmm. definitely would have gone I think so. to that 100%. Because yeah. from- the crazy thing about it is that it's the only movie in history that was made to catch a serial killer while the serial killer was still on the rampage. It's yeah. insane that someone thought that. And the fact that Tom Hansen was... No, like he had a couple of like walk-ons and he had helped friends make movies, but he owned Pizza Man restaurant, like a chain of restaurants in Los Angeles. That's what I was just reading. I was like, it says here he owned pizza restaurants. It's insane. It's like, okay, so this guy who made all of his fortune from selling pizzas decides to make a movie about the Zodiac Killer to catch him. And the methods he used to catch him were completely (laughs) wild. This sounds like, like a great biopic. I know. You know what I mean? Like the behind the scenes of trying to make that. And then you have the real Zodiac just comes to the movie and then leaves and quietly, you know. And I remember, it might have been Brett who mentioned to me that there was at one point like a sting operation or something about handwriting. How did that, is that, is that, is this a true story or not? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, a couple of methods that they used to catch the Zodiac. And the first one was, um, uh, a guy named Manny Nedwick, who was a producer on the movie, had uh, had an in with Kawasaki motorcycles. So they thought, you know, why don't you get a Kawasaki motorcycle and we'll raffle it off because that will attract the Zodiac because everybody wants a Kawasaki motorcycle, <laughs> including the Zodiac. Everybody's <laughs> got to get around. So let's get this going. So that didn't work. So the second one they had was completely insane, which was they had this um, empty meat locker, like frozen, like freezer next to the box office, and it had air holes punctured in it. And there was a buzzer next to the box office, and they had everyone who came into the theater was given a card to write down a handwriting sample. And then they were <laughs> they took the card, like Tom Hansen yeah. would take the card, and if he thought that it looked anywhere near the Zodiac's handwriting, he would hit the buzzer, and he had three dudes in the freezer ready to jump out and grab the person <laughs> oh, at the box man. office. And um, the guys in the freezer were the guys who starred in the movie. So the guy you mentioned with the wig, Grover, yeah, Bob yeah, Jones, yeah, he was great. in the freezer. <laughs> I love that. And so he was like, and he liked to fight. You know, he was like, ah, let's yeah. get this guy, let's kill him. I could tell from the performance. Yeah, There's just something in there. That- <laughs> and Bob Jones is Bob Jones in that yeah, movie. He's yeah. playing himself, basically. So uh, it was completely insane. And so they did find a guy that had handwriting that they thought matched him. So they grabbed this guy and pulled him into the bathroom and like punched him a few times. Oh. <laughs> and they're like, you know, it's him, it's him. And so it ended up maybe being him, maybe not being him. And the cool thing about it is that I, the thing I always <laughs> defaulted to is, weren't you guys worried about yeah. attacking innocent people or worried about that the Zodiac was going to come yeah, after yeah. you? Yeah. And Tom Hansen was always like, no, I was packing a 38. What do I have to be you know, oh. scared of? It's <laughs> that, amazing. This is a movie. It's this, so good. Uh, this wow. Is like a great, and so they actually do, do think that could have, there was like a, they were left well, thinking. It did they been. turn him over to the police? No, they didn't. But, and this is where it gets even crazier. <laughs> I love <laughs> For this. the next 15 years, Tom Hansen followed this guy. <laughs> oh, like, my God, no. this poor him. guy. Stalked him for 15 oh, shit. years. And, and he says to this day, like, we did a, a commentary with him for the Blu-ray. Um, he's, to this day, he, we were like, who is it? Like, tell us who it is. And he's yeah. like, nope, because I'm saving that for the FBI. Like, he yeah. thinks that he really, truly thinks that he knows who the Zodiac is to this day. Huh. It's kind of amazing. Wow. That is a commentary I'll listen to. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my <laughs> that gosh. Sounds- and, you, and you shot some on-camera stuff with him for the Blu-ray, too. We like did, There are a lot yeah. of these stories all over the, the disc. Yes. Yeah, yeah oh absolutely. He goes way in-depth on the commentary. Okay, and what the hell? There's a bonus movie called Another Son of Sam from 1977 in a 2K scan. Yes. Explain this madness. Uh, what is this? <laughs> okay, so Another Son of Sam has nothing to do with Son of Sam, let alone Another Son of Sam. But it's a sequel to Spike Lee's. Classic film, right? Obviously. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> Classic Adrian Brody, yeah. So this movie is uh, basically a proto-slasher. It's a pretty huh. straightforward mid-70s proto-slasher. It was made in the early 70s and not released till the late 70s because they wanted to... Uh, it was called Hostages First. And so when the uh, Son of Sam came out, they're like, oh, we can re-release this movie with this new title card and no one will know the difference. <laughs> um, so it. it's an absolutely... Um, it's like 
almost three steps down from Zodiac in terms of someone making a movie that probably had never seen a movie or how they function. Like, how do you do this? Because it has moments in the movie where it just breaks into, um, like, slow motion. Like, there'll be someone like, get over here, like, get to the police (laughs) police station, and the cop comes in, and then right before he's about to open the door, the police station goes slow motion, (laughs) and he opens and goes into the police. It's just complete madness. Like, why would you do that? Um, So it has a feeling of a lot of the movies, I think, that we're attracted to with Agfa, where it's like, it is from a complete different dimension it is a yeah. proto slasher police procedural made by extraterrestrials that is beamed down here for us to enjoy yeah. and it's just a completely different world that is uh, a great feeling when you watch one that is just so outside of what normal film language <laughs> is and especially because ho- the hollywood model is just so like you know it's so well even a bad hollywood film still gets you emotionally mm-hmm. because it just has this operating pattern but yeah. when you watch something like like things i remember when i first saw the opening of that is so radically different than the next 75 minutes Mm -hmm. (laughs) like and there's no connective tissue and you're just like there's a naked woman wearing a weird mask Mm -hmm. and then something else happens and then suddenly the movie becomes like a weird evil dead comedy or something Mm -hmm. i need to rewatch things you're like inspired by it and i was just like brett Brett introduced me to things hell of a drug yeah (laughs) oh it's uh it's a nice little canadian fantasia it's just like a little a little, uh, little cherry. Did you tell these guys your thing story? Oh yeah, the thing story was. I excellent. don't know how many. Well, Brett, Brett has listened to the, the occasional show on here, so he might have heard. The, I mean, the, our listeners have heard it a million times, but at jump cut, it was uh, worth repeating. It is a good story. <laughs> uh, I was there. I took a picture. I, I, I forgot his name. What's uh, Barry? Uh, so, Barry so I, so I like uh, ran this place called Jump Cut Cafe in in the valley, and we screen movies. And uh, for some, I would always pick something from my shelf to like pre it would usually be possession just to like so i'd test. look at it and test the thing and the place wasn't even open we we're closed mm. and what I, were you screening that night because wasn't it a it was like a oh beta... that's right it was called uh beta eight or uh, high hi eight. Hi hi eight. Hi eight. Hi eight it was an anthology of all those guys like a lot of them had made shorts mm. people from the era that you were talking about and there was like three of us in there eating and yeah was there was like... no, there was no one really there and i and i basically for no reason at all i was just like walking out the door and i i go Oh, you know what I should grab? I want to put things on to watch the start of that and show with like one of my like baristas so they'd see a little bit of things. So I just grabbed it just totally random off the mm-hmm. shelf. I put it on and the title card comes up, right? And it's just saying things. And I'm standing in an empty cafe and behind me, I turn around and Barry's standing there. What? Yes. And he looks at me and goes, Is this some kind of joke? And, <laughs> oh I, and I said, I said, What do you mean? And he goes, That's things. I'm Barry. That's my that's my movie. And I said, what the fuck is going like my whole brain because he didn't have the mustache anymore but this, so. isn't, this isn't the killer part oh yeah there's more there's oh yeah more. no then it gets yeah it does have a good twist well what was he in town for this he american, was in, yeah he came for the american american film, film market film market first and, time in la and yeah. he had just gotten to la which wow. is nowhere near the jump cut and he yeah it's santa monica versus studio city he just saw that some people were showing that movie this like new movie and he goes so i just came out here but i can't believe it you're showing my movie and then i i just started playing it and like we had you know got a photo together i go this is like really might be the greatest moment ever now, just, like just in terms to, of cinema like i beamed you here that's incredible so, <laughs> just to, just about yeah i mean he's had like west craven and john carpenter people he's never been more excited that, it by was just, somebody coming was in a jump glowing. cut than this it, it didn't make glowing. sense <laughs> i know it's, it's amazing. and he was glowing even more like and, and barry will always now write to me in a way where where he's it's like we've known each other for 30 years the way he <laughs> if he writes me on facebook it's like out of you know because just because of this one moment but it gets really bizarre so it's a very small place kind of like this room and there's like a couple couch and a bunch of chairs and we screen this height movie and the lights come on and everyone's doing a Q&A and then the guy doing the Q&A looks over at, at one of the couches and goes oh my god and he goes Barry who made things is sitting next to the guy who made that other movie called things in the 80s oh dennis divine they were sitting they next, were to, sitting each next other, to each other had never what? met and didn't on even the know front it couch like on right the, in the front just row these two guys sitting together and everyone was and they're like oh i've always wanted to meet you and they're shaking oh hands oh my god and i because i remember that gag and um is it, i know you guys were uh in that documentary there's two oh, of them adjust, i think it's in adjust your track yeah there's two of them adjust your tracking and the other uh, there's i remember there's rewind two. this rewind this but i think it's in we'll, adjust your tracking where it's the multiple things <laughs> yeah. where the one guy's like got a shelf where he's got the two things next to each other and i was just like this is just too crazy uh, but it shows like what you're talking about how people made something from their heart i feel like the same thing's true in the love of like cinephiles or going to movies or like film culture somehow those things happen like mm-hmm. for because of because we give a shit because yeah. somebody pulls it off their shelf and puts it on for no reason at all you know yeah what are the so, odds that the two guys that directed things would <laughs> sit I know. next to it's each a, other that's so crazy at a cafe. it never gets we are, this at is a all. cafe showing one of the weirdest things i've ever seen <laughs> i mean yes. that height film oh yeah the height thing was it yeah was but 
crazy. Mess. I mean, I had, I had a couple of good. It had some good I think stuff. there's a couple sections yeah. that you, you were good, but uh, yeah. but either way, yeah. I mean, so I know it's a it's a bit of a tangent, but it all I think it all connects to the why you mm-hmm. would do this, mm-hmm. yeah. Why you put on Agfa and why you still think, and I really am with you on this one. Uh, and it kind of goes to Becca's point about streaming, uh, why it's so important to still ha- keep it theatrically alive. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's very. I think important. it's a big part because of it. I will still watch things if I'm in a theater. Yeah, like it takes a lot for me to walk out of a theater a lot like you mentioned things um video vortex is our vhs series at the alamo that plays nationwide at all the alamos Mm -hmm. and in march we did things and um it was far and away one of the most talked about and exciting Mm. video vortexes in history and it's like it makes sense because when you're in a theater you can't escape you cannot escape things and you're just there you're in it and um it's so important to realize that like theatrically i mean that movie was never meant to be seen theatrically Mm -hmm. but it still has that effect but seeing it with a full theater of people who are there because they want to be there it's like nothing else and, yeah. so and you're important. not going to turn it off like and i do think some of the people who have probably maybe bought it because i've talked about it on this yeah. probably do watch the first minute and go what and just don't yeah. necessarily you're not captive you, right. you don't have to be but i think it's huge yeah i think like for me i, I there's one i tried tracking down for years at one point on vhs was blood cult Mm-hmm. which oh. I hadn't seen. But then when I watched it, I was like, eh. It's so <laughs> boring. Yeah, exactly. It's so boring. It's about a cop trying to eat a salad yeah. the whole time. And <laughs> he keeps finding fingers in his salad. Yeah. Ah. It really, it is kind of painful, the pacing. And, and also just be, it was, it, they claim it was the first. No, 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 no. I'm sure it wasn't, right? No, it wasn't. It was okay. either Sledgehammer or Boarding House. Yeah. And then, yeah, Sledgehammer, you know, actually has some moments in it that are actually uh, pretty amazing. Sledgehammer like really is- innovative. And interesting, but that's the thing when they're when it's just a normal, a normal traditional kind of movie, but shot on video. Mm-hmm. That's usually where it's kind of boring to me. Yeah, it is. It's yeah. almost like no, no, we have nothing. Mm-hmm. Let's make something out of that. That's when it's interesting, you yeah. know. So I guess ambition plays a, a role now. Yeah, Blood Cult. I still have the VHF though. It just isn't isn't my. Favorite. And it's like Blood Cult too. It doesn't get any better. You're hoping yeah. that like nope. oh maybe this time they're gonna. Nope, nope. <laughs> you keep suffering through. Yeah. Um, well, that, that was an exciting tangent to be able to go through again. Uh, so let's talk about this. Is the one I, uh, Rob's just pulled up on screen. It's one I've been dying to see, but the timing with Romero's passing is uh, interesting. Is Savini's effects. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that because I don't really know. This is a movie I did not know about really growing up. Yeah, I either I don't think anyone did because huh. it wasn't even available. So uh, they made this movie in the late 70s and in 1980 it had like a couple of theatrical screenings and they never really got a distributor for it. It's just mm-hmm. kind of one of those things where it fell through the cracks and no one had money. So it was just out there. Um, and then a DVD came out in 2005 that Synapse released and that's how I was introduced to the mm-hmm. movie. And I randomly rented it at a video store in Chicago one night because, it, it, you know, it said effects like a snuff movie and it had Tom Savini's name on it. And I thought, oh, that's cool. Like, I'll check it out. It's Tom Savini. And it was kind of like I thought it would be on the same level as something like Nightmares in a Damaged Brain, yeah. which was Tom Savini was connected to. And it's pretty good. Maybe, right? No, he doesn't, yeah. doesn't he deny his, his he, it? Was, he was. You can yeah. tell it's there's, great effects. That's yeah, there's why. photos of him. Too oh, okay. That's right. Yeah, totally. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so um, that was like total nerdy. Yeah, that was a pretty nerdy uh, Guys, there's oh, no, photos of him that. on the set. I don't know if you knew that. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so I saw FX and I fell in love with the movie because it really scared me. Oh. And it, it takes a lot for movies to scare me because I feel like you, you watch a lot of horror movies yeah. and it's like that hitting those beats that scare you is really important. So it was it was really I thought it was really great. And I was really taken with it. It was very like a slow pace, like slow burn, but it scared me. It reminded me of like kind of like a Brian De Palma demo movie or yeah. something mixed with the Pittsburgh aesthetic. Oh, so, so another Pittsburgh film. Yeah, it's Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah, it's cool. all Pittsburgh. So, so everyone uh, that worked on that. I mean, the the lineage of people who, if not for them, like even like Dawn of the Dead wouldn't even have turned out what it was if it wasn't for like Zilla Clinton, who produced the movie and Pasquale Bubo, who edited it. They were all so involved. Hmm. Um, but I, I really love the movie. And so when I first uh, started working at the Alamo Draft House and Sebastian showed me the archive for the first time, um, my mind was blown just because of all the amazing prints that were there. But then I was like turning the corner and I saw a box that said effects on it. And I was like, that can't be the, the Pittsburgh effects because it was never released theatrically. There can't be a print of it. And it turned out it was. Um, we had uh, a print of it, and we know now that it was it's the only print in existence, but at the wow. time I didn't know that. Sure. Wow. So um, I booked it for a Terror Tuesday, which is our weekly horror series in Austin, and it sold out. It was really great. People loved it. And then we got an email from John Harrison a few months oh. later, who is the producer yeah. and star of the movie. And John Harrison was also did the score for Creep Show and Day of the Dead. Directed and, Creep Show yeah. too, didn't And uh, he directed Tales from the Dark Side of the that's movie. One, yeah, oh, yeah. that's one, yeah. Yeah. So we got an email from him and he was like, oh, hey, I, I saw that you show effects. And I didn't know you guys were doing that. And um, if you do it again, I'd love to come out, you know, come out to the show. And so I was really blown. I was super excited to talk to him because I love the movie so much. So 
I got on the phone with him really just to tell him how much I love the movie. And like, you guys should know that there are people out there that appreciate this because it was always like, oh, this thing is garbage because it was never released and no one cares about it. It's too slow. It's boring, like whatever. And I loved it. So I wanted them to know that. So I was talking to him about that. And then we just started talking and I was like, oh, we're starting this new thing with Agfa. We would love to get the movie out there. And he's like, well, what do you, what do you want to do? And I said, well, do you have any plans for Blu-ray? And they said, nope. And I said, well, do you want to put this out? And they said, yes. So um, we were super excited. Um, And it actually, what happened is that uh, the original negative that they had years ago is now lost. And then John had one print and it was badly damaged. So it's no longer around or playable. So it ends up that Agfa has the only oh, wow. only existing print. Um, so we used our print for the 4K transfer and uh, went from there. It was It's pretty awesome how that works. And I think it goes to show like... Um, the crazy things that happened at the Alamo Draft House, like things yeah. are just like, it's like, what? Like, how did yeah. this happen from just doing a screening? Um, but uh, it's really cool. And we're super grateful to be putting it out. And everyone that worked on effects is so sweet and genuine. Like, they cannot believe, like, actually, this Tuesday coming up, we're having a casting crew reunion in Austin at Terror oh, Tuesday cool. with all of them. There's like eight people coming out. Oh, wow. And um, it's the first time they've all been together in decades. Um, oh, so great. they're really pumped. And it's it's just a really cool feeling to be able to do that for filmmakers that, feel like they failed like you know we they all have amazing careers now and they have nothing to be worried about but this one thing that they really put their hearts into and they feel like all these years has been like oh it's this thing we did and they don't have to be embarrassed anymore because there's going to be 180 people in austin watching this movie with them and they can feel like how much love there is um it's really gratifying it's like to make someone feel that i feel like that's kind of like silent night deadly night too and Mm -hmm. like trying to make eric realize yeah yeah how great it was and seeing him accept it like literally seeing him come to terms with that people actually didn't think it was just a joke it's kind of cool it's kind of a we were were on the hunt for eric freeman for years and we finally got him out is he the star of yeah he's and we had him and the we had him the killer from two and the killer from one together guest on the show together oh that's amazing i gotta go back and listen to that it's great it It really is and and seeing them talk even like before they walked on this room like seeing them backstage and the way they were relating to each other it was almost like seeing someone like you're the only person on earth who knows how i feel like these two like that's how it felt felt like these two good like separated brothers yeah. who suddenly could like revel in each other's yeah. understanding of this character it's like it was, it was special i mean yeah. that's it is special like you know we do a podcast and sometimes it's just a show and sometimes there are special beats you run a, a theater and, and oh, sometimes yeah. you're gonna have thing, a special yeah. energy and it's uh it keeps this exciting i think absolutely know, and interesting yeah and this one comes out august 22nd yeah yeah mm-hmm. all right so that one's coming out august 22nd and uh i haven't seen it how i mean how far along are you in terms of uh, other blu-ray releases or, or stuff or how does that play into theatrical because i assume you're restoring these films because you mm-hmm. want people to see them in yes. the theater too mm-hmm. yeah yeah they, yes. they go hand in hand i mean the way we've been doing it is that the month that it's coming out the first of that month is when it's available theatrically for booking so nice. like effects has been available august 1st because it comes out august 22nd so that's the way we've been doing it mm-hmm. um and as far as the release for agfa it's planned out now through december of 2018 so oh wow. wow we have uh the next five releases are already in the can and being produced and then we have complete like next year we have eight or nine coming oh, wow. out what, yeah. you, what do you have on the slate if, um, I if can, you're allowed to talk about it. Yeah, I can yeah. tell you the next couple for sure. Okay. Um, so um, After Effects on October 17th is Bat Pussy. Oh, cool. <laughs> yes. I haven't seen it, but I've heard you talk about it on another yeah, show. Yeah, that's, that's another right. Agfa Something Weird that's release. Cool. Um, and then after that, we have Edward's The Violent Years oh. in November, which is another Agfa and Something Weird. And then um, the first of the year in January is one we haven't announced yet. It's uh, The Sword and the Claw, which is a Turkish exploitation mm-hmm. movie starring Kunit Arkin which is mostly known in the U.S. as Lion Man from 1975. So this is a, another dub of it from the 70s called The Sword and the Claw. Was that one that was featured in the Turkish ripoff documentary? Yeah, was you know? this oh, like yeah. a sword and Big sandal time. ripoff oh, cool. movie? Yeah, it's kind of like, actually, it is like Conan the Barbarian meets The Three Stooges meets Dolomite. That's oh, how I shit. explain it wow. to people. It's, it's pretty intense. It's pretty great. Um, it's about a, a king that gets his hands cut off and his family taken away, and then he He's raised by lions, and then he comes back for revenge with these insane lion claws. Oh, They're my like, God. Like, he's just pulled up a picture. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Oh, my. Yeah. Yes. That's okay, it. I'm in. Wonderful. And, <laughs> yeah. So we have that one, and then um, we're actually uh, – after that, we're, we're actually – which we also haven't announced, but I guess I'm going to talk about it – is um, Agfa and Bleeding Skull are teaming up. 
um, starting in 2018 um, to put out Blu-rays. So it's going to oh, be cool. kind of like the um, something Agfa and something weird to be Agfa and Bleeding Skull. And what, what Bleeding out. Skull titles have you guys put out? So, yeah, because I haven't seen Blonde Death yet. Is oh, that, you got to see Was that put out Death. on VHS only? It's VHS and DVD. Oh, okay. And it's, they've been released through Mondo, which okay. is the, the boutique right. art label of yeah. the Alamo Drafthouse. So they're all available exclusively through Mondo's site. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you what gotta, is Blonde Death? Because I, I couldn't tell oh, what man. era it was from. When I saw the stills, I was like, is this a modern film doing a throwback or is it actually an older film? I couldn't tell from the little stills I saw. Oh, well, that must mean that it's really effective at mm-hmm. your advertising, <laughs> marketing. Yeah, yeah, uh, early 80s. Okay, yeah. Okay. And uh, shot by a guy named James Dillinger, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's like what happens when John Waters meets uh, OC Hardcore. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow. And, uh, what, and some of it is actually shot inside Disneyland. What was uh, that movie yeah. that was filmed at yeah, Disney yeah, World? Yeah. Escape. Escape. Escape from Tomorrow. From yeah. So it's actually, it predates that oh, by wow. 25 years. Mm-hmm. But it's all stolen Disneyland oh, stuff. Totally. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Jungle Trap, is that a recent one? Yeah, Jungle Trap just came out last month. Jungle Trap was uh, an insane experience. I can sum it up in like really quickly if you want. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because isn't isn't this about a? Isn't there a director who had unfinished work? Yeah, yeah. So James Bryan, Uh who you guys might know, Don't Go in the Woods. Uh, Yeah. Okay. Okay. So James Bryan, the director of Don't Go in the Woods, and Renee Harmon, who is his creative partner, and she did Frozen Scream. I don't know if you guys know Frozen Scream. It's from 1980. You might know it. You should see it. It's really great. Uh So Renee Harmon is kind of like an unsung woman in exploitation and horror that no one really talks about, but she made truly insane movies. Huh. What's her um, name? One more Renee time. Harmon. Yeah, write that down. Huh? So um, Renee Harmon and James Bryan had a long creative partnership that started with Lady Street Fighter. And um, so what happened with Jungle Trap is they had made a couple movies together in the 80s. One was called Run, Coyote, Run. And it was, it was from 87, which is Renee Harmon had this amazing idea, which is I don't have the budget to put together a full movie. So why don't I just take pieces of all of my other movies and then <laughs> shoot new scenes on video yeah. and put it all together as one insane mind-blowing thing so that's what they did with run coyote run and then jungle trap was the last project they worked on together um which was supposed to be a straightforward basically jungle horror movie um and um they shot the whole thing and they shot it basically in renee's mom's backyard so they built up a jungle and it's basically it's kind of like a ghost movie it's like a ghost like haunted hotel and there's like killers on the loose and it's like these molly warriors who are coming back for revenge so what happened is that they finished the movie and no one was interested. They didn't have, it wasn't like James, Jim's put it together as like a rough cut, like just to show potential distributors and no one wanted it. There was no mm-hmm. music on it. There was no sound effects. It was just like, here's what we can do. We need money to finish it. And it was at the time when, you know, like 1989, 1990, where that kind of direct to video shot and video stuff was falling, falling through yeah. because people were on like, they, they were like, oh, I know what you're doing. You're going to sell me this like shot on video thing. It's not a real movie. So it's kind of like, falling by the wayside especially in places like blockbuster who had previously been into that like the polonia brothers feeders like they took that and made it a hit at blockbuster but then people started to figure out that it's a shot on video movies so mm. they didn't want it so anyway the bottom fell through and they never finished the movie and so we released run coyote run with jim on bleeding skull video and we were at his house to pick up the master tapes for that and he has this amazing film barn at his house in lufkin texas which is like this huge like warehouse like an airplane hangar with all of his memorabilia and all of his negatives and all of his film and there's a plastic bin marked jungle trap <laughs> and we said zach and i said what is jungle trap and he said oh that's the last movie renee and i worked on we never finished it do you want to want to look at it and we're like yes please can we see <laughs> what this is so um it existed on beta sp masters and so he transferred it for us and sent it to us and uh, zach annie and i sat down and watched Jungle Trap in its raw form, and we were so entertained by it. And we thought, you know, like all of the hard work that Renee Harmon put into her career, and it never got her anywhere, and Jim Bryan too, to a certain extent, um, we thought this should be out there. Like this, their last masterpiece that they made together should be out there. So we asked Jim if we could um, help him finish the movie, and he said yes. So we hired um, an editor, Don Suenos, who edited the movie, and then Annie and I recorded the soundtrack on vintage synthesizers so that would be very yeah, authentic cool. to the era. And we did a new sound mix and we finished the movie with Jim and we put it out and we premiered it at Fantastic Fest last year and it was amazing. It was the first time he had seen it ever it was with a crowd at Fantastic Fest. Um, so it was just a really cool and insane experience. Wow. That's what, I'm researching this woman. <laughs> I'm obsessed with her now. She's she's amazing. Wow. And she also acted in a movie called Van Nuys Boulevard, which is apparently an exploitation film about Van Nuys Boulevard. Wow. Yeah, it's good. I, you I, should check it, it is. out. Okay. Yeah. I just wrote it down. I will have it yeah. by next week. You should also write down Escape from the Insane Asylum. Uh, yes. 
Escape from the Insane Asylum. Key work of Renee Harmon. Absolutely. And mm. what's the what's the relationship been like with Mondo? Because obviously they have a very you know they're kind of a big part of the collector's market yeah. uh, in 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 all avenues with vinyl and and everything. So um, how's it been getting? access to that audience specifically for these movies i think every single day we have asked ourselves oh, i cannot believe why are they doing this how is it possible because it's like you know mondo is putting out the back to the future soundtrack and then they're putting out night feeder by bleeding skull and it's like what like doesn't really Bless them. yes exactly so it's been great we've been very lucky and they've been so sweet to us and so it's it's kind of a dream to actually do that with them it's it's been great uh, I'd, I'd, uh, we were going to talk about gems and we'd love to hear what you guys mm-hmm. brought to the mm-hmm. table, but the ones that I want to bring up are because I'm originally from Long Island, New York, mm-hmm. and I discovered these on DVD mm-hmm. and I are wish you I say, are you going to say Nathan? Schiff? Yes, I am. And okay, I'm give say, me the name of this one. Yes. His name is Nathan Schiff and he made, was it three films? Mm-hmm. The, the ones I remember, they were on DVD briefly. Yeah. Uh, Long Island Cannibal Massacre. Yes. Uh, they don't cut the grass anymore. Mm-hmm. And Weasels Rip My Flesh. Yep. Which wow. is a wonderful These title. Are amazing title. Yeah, they're great titles. Weasels Rip My Flesh. Uh, what do you What do you know about these films? When did you Do you also Do you still have the DVDs? Because yeah. I regret not having them. Anymore. I do. Um, you, it's amazing you brought this up. He's one of my all timers for Bleeding Skull. He's really? All time right. favorite Bleeding Skull filmmakers, Nathan Schiff. Yeah, I know a lot about. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know. His movies, for me, completely, this aesthetic I'm talking about where this thing coming from someone else that it can't possibly come from anyone else, this idea that a teenager on Long Island when he was 16 years old spent $500 to make a full-length movie on Super 8. Yeah. And it turns out being this incredibly dreamy, like, landscape of, like, gore and all of his influences and his relatives and, like, all of this stuff thrown together is something so charming and so wonderful about it. And the movies are actually great. Like, they're all so good. I mean, they don't cut the grass anymore. It gets really gory and really hard to watch. Yeah, I'm looking at pictures of it right now. It looks like they used real entrails. It's su- they did. Yeah, okay. it's super intense. <laughs> and that one's, like, really intense. But it's also a satire. That was one he's like, he's like, I'm 18 now, so I'm going to say something about consumerism in America, <laughs> you know, about through this gore movie. But um, it's really fascinating. Like, incredible that he did it. He made another one called Vermilion Eyes in the early 90s, which is – it's like have you you've seen you've even seen oh it's it's real deal it's like huh. stepping up to the next uh, like adult listen an adult growing out of these movies to make this like serious exploitation horror movie see wow. i felt like when we were doing well when we, i knew you guys were coming on i like i have some but we've been doing the show for so long like 140 i feel like all the ones i wanted to talk about i've already talked about i kind of want to <laughs> listen yeah no we, we want the recommendation yeah i kind of want to get want to hear some of the gems i mean there's ones like the only one that always comes up for me because i still haven't found a good copy is candy snatchers it's just a movie mm-hmm. I, I wish there was a nice clean version but i guess yeah, I copyright the, hell i yes. have the dvd okay. of it but it's not pretty yeah, yeah i would say that at this point the dvd is most likely maybe one of the last times it's going to be i don't know it's on home because they couldn't yeah. check they no one's been able to trace the ownership right yeah there's it's pretty messy messy yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a shame but uh, like so i mean i have things like that but i feel like i've talked about them so much i'd really like to hear your you know i'm more interested to hear mm-hmm. about some you know the ones that you recommend to people or things that you just personally love okay Oh, no, Both of you or either of you. Okay. Um, well, I did write down some. Yes. Uh, because you guys asked me too, so thanks for that. Um, so um, a subgenre of horror that I really find comforting in the same way I find like Buster Keaton silent comedies comforting mm-hmm. is um, 1950s and 60s Mexican horror movies. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Um, yeah. So um, a lot of people know them through the versions that were dubbed by K. Gordon Murray and, and imported into the U.S. like The Brainiac is, is a big one mm-hmm. and El Vampiro. Um, world of the vampires um, and they're all really comforting and fascinating to me because they have the gothic feel of universal horror movies but they are done on budgets far less than that so you kind of get this um, I don't know this very more of a low budget feel of what someone's interpreting universal monsters as mm-hmm. um, and they're really fascinating and they're really fun and comforting and charming and so the the my favorite one that I've come across is called Ship of Monsters from mm-hmm. 1960 and the really cool thing about that movie is that at I guess, like, first glance, it's a horror movie. It's a horror movie about a ship of monsters. <laughs> but the interesting thing about how it got there is that the plot of the movie is that um, two women from Venus, and in Venus they have no men, so they have to go across the galaxy to find men to marry so that they can make more people. Um, they pick up, like, the most grotesque monsters, like, lo-fi monsters you've ever seen in the 1950s. They are incredible-looking, like, insane monsters. Oh, yeah. I'm so they pick up these that. monsters and put them on the ship, and then they land in Mexico, and there's this, like, um, kind of, like, singing cowboy they meet in Mexico, <laughs> and it turns into, like, this, like, pop musical 
um, with this cowboy and then he fights the monsters and then there's a robot that comes out at the end and fights everyone. And it is just so much, it's just pure joy in the form of like, it's a, like a Mexican horror movie, musical, sci-fi, <laughs> like, and the songs are great because everyone's having so much fun. I usually hate musicals. Like I can't even get five minutes into a musical, but this movie is just like, oh, it's so nice. And it's so insane. Like the visuals, you're like, this is 1960. Like these monsters are totally crazy. They look so weird. I can vouch for it. He just pulled up some photos. And I was, it was so funny. Nice. I just happened to be going through the photos mm-hmm. as you mentioned everything. Like, yeah. Like as the robots, monster. Yeah. monster. <laughs> I got a PowerPoint <laughs> slide. Yeah, pretty much. That <laughs> was pretty funny. Oh, cool. Ship of monsters and is this uh, difficult to track down or yeah there's a um there's a mexican dvd that doesn't have subtitles so what you have to do is buy the dvd and download the subtitles and then combine them on wow. your computer wow. if you want subs <laughs> or you could download you know like or a, ask or just somebody to do it it's you. probably on youtube i'm sure it's on youtube but uh That's yeah great. that one is uh one of the best of those kind cool that nice. looks cool what about, what about you, you brett? brett do you have a recommendation for us um uh, i've heard you guys talk about Arrow's um, American Horror Project uh-huh. box set. Yeah, yeah. I, I really want people to see Malatesta's Carnival of Blood. I really want people to see it. It's a phenomenal discovery. It like it's off the charts discovery. It's like uh, Carnival of Souls meets Messiah of Evil. Yeah, I know. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, it's 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 truly off the rails, and it's both intentional art, like hard math, strange <laughs> camera choices, and like why are we looking at their shoulder? Did the guy you know? own the carnival? Is that how they no. got? Okay, no, I just no, assumed no. it was some guy who owned a carnival. It was like, hey, we could shoot here off season. The guy who directed is Christopher Spieth, who uh-huh. primarily did commercials and documentaries uh-huh. and uh and we're burying the lead herve villachez co-stars in the movie oh, yeah. mm-hmm. uh it's just got this amazing found trash prop aesthetic kind of like wayne white uh pb's big event uh pb's playhouse at one point there's a giant uh puppet head that is talking and i realized oh they took a volkswagen bug and turned it upside down <laughs> and the hood of the car is the mouth of the puppet Huh. This is really inventive stuff <laughs> yeah. going on. Wow. And uh, the the loose premise of the movie is that the impresario of the carnival, Mr. Malatesta, uh, hires people to – lures them to work at the carnival so that he can then uh, kidnap them and feed them to the cannibals living in the cave underneath the carnival who are watching scratchy 16-millimeter silent films like Phantom of the Opera yeah. while they're tearing uh, their victims apart. Stunning. I don't. I don't know what to say about it. It's like midnight me train with like the cave and yeah. There's there's a lot going on there. I feel like I need to see this. Yeah. I hope they do more uh, another follow up to that. Uh, another another collection. Part. Yeah. I talked to Fran at Arrow and he told me one title of the volume two and uh-huh. I'm totally forgetting it. I don't remember. Uh, what it was. Uh, yeah. Oh, but there is a volume two coming. Uh, yeah, I feel maybe. like. <laughs> with, like, I don't know. With the yeah. volume one, um, the witch that came from the sea seemed to get all the action um, mm. just because I guess it has a lot of penises in it. So that does it. Um, <laughs> literal it, action. Literal okay. action. Yeah. Uh, They're all so different, all those three movies. Yeah. Vastly. And that's one that we didn't discuss when we did Rape Revenge films a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah, we By did. far the best cover art of like many, many movies. What's the other one? Not the art. psychic. What's it called? The, the, premonition. the, the premonition. premonition. I actually, I actually found that one because I knew nothing about it and I heard the least about it in terms of people going crazy i actually really enjoyed watching that one i mm-hmm. thought it was interesting but I, yeah the the witch who came from sea is actually pretty interesting mm-hmm. actually a good a good movie yeah. uh quality performance interesting thing yeah um okay so that's that's two and that one's much easier for people to track down <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anyone else? I'll, yeah, I'll, throw, one in? I'll let throw, you throw in one. In. one. Um, and this one is, I, I will say, I wrote an article about this on Blumhouse, and for years it had been my holy grail of you will never find a copy of this movie. And within minutes of me posting it, somebody sent me a YouTube oh, link. Cool. Nice. Yeah. I was like, fuck you, Found. Internet, but that's kind of awesome. Yeah. So this one's called Etrapados. And have you guys heard of this? I've heard of this. Excellent. It is from 1981. Hmm. And I saw a bootleg copy of this when I was in college. And I have not seen it since. And I need to watch the YouTube link to see Hmm. if it is as good as I remember. What is it? Actual what? Atropados. It is the, I want to say the Spanish, uh, you might be able to translate this. It's Spanish for uh, caught up or trapped or something like that. Maybe, no, probably not. not. Bell, okay. um, so Atropados, from what I remember, it is about um, a group of people in this apartment building and there is some type of earthquake or natural disaster and everybody gets trapped in the basement and they can't get out and they set up their own society down there, but they are trapped there for years. 
and they set up their own society. Oh, this is and uh, then, people who are in the dark too. No, uh, <laughs> but this is where but you'll you like it. I remember that you would. This is kind of like uh-huh. your movie, Elric, because after a while they set up their own society, and I. It's not very many. It's like four people, but it starts becoming unclear if things are real or not because <laughs> things start getting really fantastical while they're down there and they can't get out. And from there, it's kind of like, you don't know what's going on or this is all in somebody's head or anything like that. It's mm. a, I remember that it, um, when I researched it before, it was like a film that it had done a festival run in the 1980s and never gotten a release anywhere. Some bootleg copies have come out. Apparently there's one on the internet now. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is on YouTube. And yes. yeah, it's, it's, it's trapped. That's trapped. Cool. It's okay. atrapados. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's oh, okay. what it means. My, it means trapped my in Spanish. Spanish is awful. And it's directed by a guy who did a notable, interesting late '80s horror. I think. Hmm. If I, I I'm uh, pulling that out of my head. I Matthew don't Patrick is the yes. director, and he did some kind of like really awesome. Hider in se- the house. Yes, that's. Oh, oh. So, yeah. So oh, bless the IMDb. <laughs> I need to rewatch. Um, I'm going I to see this. To I slaughter this title again, Atropatos. Oh. I need to rewatch it. Hider in the house is the one with creepy Gary Busey standing oh. behind the girl oh, in, that, in yeah. the box. Yeah. Wow. I need to rewatch this to remember if it's as awesome as i remember it it's black and white even though that it was 80s i recall it being black and white the whole way through um but i remember seeing it in college and being like this movie is everything and then i was never able to see it again Okay. And it never had a release. Like, I don't even think it don't went ever watch to it VHS. Again. Never. Let, let those never. lingering <laughs> phantoms guide you in life. There's nothing better than that. <laughs> I'd love to talk about some of the Canadian stuff that I've loved over the years. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah Exploitation is one of my favorites. Uh, uh, one of my absolute favorites is Deadline. Do you know Deadline? I know Deadline. Oh, oh yeah. this one's so hot. It's like 1980. There's no, I don't know the actual year because I've seen things as wild as like 1980 and then 1987. Uh-huh, so it's like yeah. one of those IMDb wormhole things. Right. And it's about uh, a Stephen King-esque author and screenwriter who has extreme writer's block. So half the movie alternates between his dreary home life of his coked-out wife and his whining uh, son and daughter. And it alternates between that and fantasy sequences of extreme, uh, like, high-concept gore that he, it's a, you're imagining his imagining of what he's trying to break through his writer's block with. And there's a scene where a telepathic goat turn uh, like through thoughts turns on a thresher that a farmer is working on and sucks him into the thresher and decapitates him there's a whole sequence where there's a nazi mad scientist who figures out that this one rock band can play a certain frequency that makes hobo's guts explode wow <laughs> and it works wow yeah. what is the name of this movie deadline? again deadline it sounds like a more fun cat in the brain like, I mean, yeah. I know a lot of yeah. people love Cat in the Brain, but there's something not that fun about Cat no. in the Brain. You it know? feels... It, it, plon- it you know, kind of plunks along. There's nothing to get to the gore. I mean, there's yeah, gore yeah. in it, but there's very little meat to I mean, the idea is great, and I love that he's dressed like Elmer Fudd. He I has love that great it. hat on. <laughs> yeah, he really does look great. But. Got okay, I got a, Another really hot one is uh, Murder by Phone. Uh, yeah, I AKA, just saw the trailer for that for the first time. A.K.A. Bells with Richard Chamberlain and John Houseman. Yeah. And it's scanners, but with like a payphone. Yeah. And it turns out, uh, this will make you see it. Spoiler, it's about the evil telephone company. It's a conspiracy with the phone company and the government to like blow people's heads up. Uh, Phil Blankenship showed uh, the trailer for it before Lisa. When he did his oh, triple no, wow. feature of Scream for Help, Stepfather and Lisa. And it was the trailers in between. He he, he did a great job of programming wow. those. Did you see Scream, of, Scream for Help? Oh, man. Yeah. It, it, it just, was amazing, it right? It brought the oh, house so down. good. It is currently streaming on Voodoo. Um, yeah, that, so you don't have to be in LA to see it. But it was it. such a good like audience. Movie. Oh, I totally yeah, believe I it. it that like way. that, it yeah. really was. <laughs> it was just so much fun. Um, <laughs> all right, you're you're back up. What do you what oh, do you got? Uh, let's see, back up. Well, um, I'm going to stay in the Mexican horror arena, and I'm going to go ahead about 30 years to 1988 um, oh, wow. to a movie called Don't Panic. Okay. I don't know if you guys have heard of this movie. Uh-uh. I have a number of Mexican horrors on my list, but I don't oh, have great. Don't Panic. So do go on, sir. So Don't Panic is something I discovered through Bleeding Skull. And then it was another movie when I moved to Austin and saw the Agfa archive and noticed that actually it was beforehand because I did Don't Panic at Cinefamily from Agfa's print. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it's very much in, in part of Agfa because we have a print and it's like, you know, no one has a print of this movie. But anyway, this movie Don't Panic is really notable because – the great thing that happened with Mexican horror in the late 80s is that they were just looking to other movies in America that were really popular and completely ripping them off. Um, so you get a movie like Trampa Infernal, which is the Freddy Krueger, Mexican Freddy yeah. Krueger, but, you know, he has the Freddy Claw and stuff, but he also has a machine gun. So <laughs> One ups it. And that's what it makes these movies so excellent because yeah. it's like, again, like no rules here. Let's just do this but do it better. Um, so Don't Panic is really cool because it's another Nightmare on Elm Street ripoff. 
Uh, but the interesting thing about it is that the main character, whose name is Michael, he is a high school kid. He's like a regular high school kid, rides his BMX to bike. He's fallen in love with his girlfriend. Um, but then he goes home at night and he puts on a pair of dinosaur pajamas. <laughs> and when I say dinosaur pajamas, I mean full on. He is an adult, like a 20 something man wearing children's pajamas. Oh, like total dinosaurs. onesie? Oh, yeah. No, they're actually the twosie. They're like, they're like the, um, like, like Superman underoos, oh, like back in the 80s. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. they're like that. Um, so he wears this through the entire movie while he's battling demons and trying to save his friends from, you know, like this Freddy Krueger-esque thing. And it is absolutely amazing, like crowd slaying, incredibly fun movie um, that just delivers on all levels. And a lot of people don't really know about it. And it's it's so fun. It's so good. Is it because this cover that I'm looking at looks like it's an English title. Is an English language dubbed or it's something? dubbed? It's oh, dubbed cool. in English. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And this is something that is it might play at Friday Night Frights here in L.A. at Cinefamily, maybe end of September. Oh, okay. Like cool. All right. Ooh, yeah, yeah. I, that's, that's, that's the way that we got to see it then. Keep me up at midnight, yeah. maybe. <laughs> mm-hmm. nice. As long as it's under two hours. The, oh, it is. When yeah. they should, they recently showing The Tenant at, at, at midnight, I was just like, come on, guys. You don't, <laughs> that, that's a movie to start at 10 p.m. <laughs> I don't think any movie needs to be two hours, yeah. period. Yeah, I know. Well, especially in the kind of movies we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. It's always like 88-minute sweet spot. I, mine's 72. Oh, like yeah. 72 is yeah. it. That's, that's it. Pretty good. We went to see Eyes of Fire oh, yeah. last mm. fall, and that one was at midnight. And I was yeah. like, I will see this in a theater because I loved the VHS so much in, um from my childhood and even that one and i mean that one's like crazy demonic yeah, kids amazing running around sequences. amazing stuff and even that one i was like i'm fading i am <laughs> fading oh demon kids back i'm still fading yeah so. yeah sometimes like if it was like sledgehammer or something which is how i saw a sledgehammer was at cine family you know when it first mm-hmm. you guys first but seeing that at midnight made total sense because the being delusional actually helps <laughs> yeah just like, just like the beyond right where we'd yeah. fall asleep for a bit of the beyond you wake and up then and we'd then go, wake oh, up shit. all yeah. three of us saw um we went to the screening of the beyond yeah. at the that's how we all we're getting old. And, yeah, and all three of us fell asleep, and we'd like wake up at intervals and be like, and we feel like we're in the beyond. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, totally. Like, totally. Totally. It doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's kind of a magical. You probably yeah. missed, you know, the, the clunky part, which is great. Yeah, I'd wake <laughs> yeah, up. Exactly. There's spiders pulling people's faces yeah. off, and I'm back out. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. panic. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. It's very exciting. I've got one that challenges everyone's notion of the 2000s. So uh, part of this fun that we get to have uh, at AGFA with all of our label partners is that the Intervision titles are also part of what we can put in theaters, which is really exciting. And the biggest discovery for me is, okay, so in the mid-2000s, Bruno Mattei decided to make a run of movies as if no one told him it wasn't the 80s anymore. So he basically Hmm. made 80s Bruno Mattei movies in the 2000s. Hmm. And the one that really got me... It's titled on DVD, Island of the Living Dead. I don't know what its original title is, but this tore my head off. I couldn't (laughs) believe how entertained minute by minute I was. And apparently, according to David Gregory of Severin, they're all like that. Huh. So wow. Island of the Living Dead was just primo horseshit. Have they put that out yet? Yeah, Yeah, I know they they did because I I sort of – I saw my, Dave Parker owns them all. Yeah, no, my friend, um, one of my friends brought it over not too long ago, and I was kind of, I was into it. He's like, let's just watch the first few minutes and see if this mm-hmm. is going to be the movie. Yeah. And he vetoed it. <laughs> he was like, no. He vetoed it. Yeah, he's like, five minutes, like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, but it's kind of crazy already. He is so, not a curious person because right. that movie instantly raises the antenna of anyone who's curious about it's pretty, like, It was thing. pretty crazy what we saw. So, no, you, I'm going to go back to it. It is not going to out him on the show. You'll tell me after. No, I will. I will. <laughs> who, who am I publicly <laughs> shaming? Was yet? there kind of just a native prejudice about a movie from 2006 is that why it was no video? no no honestly i think we had already we'd already agreed to watch something else so it was kind of like already in our heads like well we're watching this tonight but then it's like but i brought this so if this is amazing maybe we'll watch both but no that's a shame the first Sorry. five minutes holds an immense amount of promise for anyone yes. who's into <laughs> just weird stuff of any kind so yeah all right there's like Sounds incredibly cool. bad dubbing there's there's like a, a women in prison island subplot and there's pirates and then Shit blows up. I mean, come on. Shit blows up. <laughs> Island of the Living Dead. You, yes. This one wasn't on the list I prepared today, and it's definitely not exploitation, but I just discovered an Italian horror film from the 2000s that I was like, why have I never seen this? It was actually a lot of fun called Red Riding or Red. red it's not Red Riding Hood. It's got it's like Red Hood or something like that. Hmm. It's from 2001, Rob. See if you can look it up. It's um, a female protagonist. She's probably 13, and she actually narrates the entire film while she goes around and kills her classmates and her family, and she's being raised by her grandmother. And the whole time she's being followed around by this giant, like, seven-foot wolf with this metal mask on. 
Whoa. And it's crazy. Hmm. And I had never seen this before, um, but I stumbled on it a couple of weeks ago and it was blind buy for me, but I was pleasantly surprised. And that's a picture of the giant wolf with the metal oh, mask. Oh, is this 2003? 2003. But the creative and, title, Red Riding Hood. Okay, yeah. it is Red, <laughs> Red Riding, Riding Hood. Hood. I was like, I swear Not there's something more to it. surprised you wouldn't be able to, to find it. it. But it's weird because she like narrates as she goes along huh. and she's the killer too. So it's from her perspective as she kills people. Cover right there. Um, and Vincent Gallo behind the mask right <laughs> we can fingers crossed <laughs> let's just all believe that yeah it definitely was not a flawless movie but it was definitely one that i was like why have i never seen this and mm. it has some really interesting notes to cool. it so that sounds good to me yeah all right okay so any other I'll gems throw- before we before yeah before we wrap up uh, yeah i mean um i don't i mean how so i, I want to talk about the movie the love witch Okay. Okay. I don't know okay. if you guys have seen The Love Witch. I saw it in 2016. I, I, I haven't yet, and it was because of my love of these kind of movies that uh-huh. I actually haven't watched it because I have almost this reverse fear from the trailer that mm-hmm. it's going to be not satirizing, but there's this feeling of like imitation, mm-hmm. yeah, she, the uncanny well, almost. So, and, without capturing so I'm, right, the, the essence. What you have described, uh-huh. I hate. I yeah, hate yeah, that in I movies. Think I, that I hate too. it so much. And I think I felt the same way because I, I mean, honestly, the trailer from The Love Witch, it's not the, it's not the greatest. Yeah. Not the greatest. But so The Love Witch, uh, I was really, really into because uh, for a long time, I didn't follow new horror movies. I was like, ah, like I've had enough. Like yeah. I think, you know, we were talking about Rob Zombie, like Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. I went to see that at the yeah. theater. And I'm like, I'm done. Like I don't need yeah. to see any more <laughs> movies at the theater. No offense to anyone that's listening that loves yeah. that movie. It's yeah. just, you know, different strokes, different right. folks. So I was kind of like, there's so much good stuff in the past to watch that I haven't seen. So I'm just going to focus on that. And so um, one of my colleagues at the Alamo, Tommy Swenson, gave me a screener for this movie, The Love Witch. And he's like, I think you should watch this. And I'm like, what is it? And he's like, I'm not going to tell you anything. Just go home tonight and watch it. And I watched it and I loved it so much because I really like, it reminded me a lot of what um, like John Landis did with Schlock and Stuart Gordon did with From Beyond, which is taking their love for genre and making it into something new by also paying tribute to what they love about it. And The Love of Witch was really like that for me, too. I thought it was like the first horror movie in a really, really long time hmm. that really felt like it was doing something different. And it was taking genre and moving it to the next level. Like, this is something brand new. Because I think uh, the filmmaker, Anna Biller, who did it, um, she did all the sets herself. She sewed everything that happened. She painted every painting in, in her the movie. previous film. She's the star. V- too, yeah, Viva. Yeah. yeah, I had seen Viva before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Viva is like way different. Viva is very much like it's so goofy and yeah. so like yeah. But the Love Witch to me is very sincere and it's like. Yeah, it's like taking your influences and making something totally new with it. I think it's really unique. It's a really like new revision, you know, for genre. I think it's a really special movie. So I, I, like, I now promise I will watch it. Because yeah, you of might, you might take it. I, I, uh, I like Anna a lot as a mm-hmm. person. I, I think she is of another mentality as a yeah. filmmaker. Like, because again, like you said, like she makes all the designs. Yeah. And she sees the world in a very different way based yeah. on my conversations with her. These aren't for me. Yeah, I, I, you know, Viva or The Love Witch, but I get why people like it and. There is a sincerity and genuine nature to it. It's mm-hmm. not like trying to rip off what her influences are. It's yeah. like she really believes those influences. Yeah, yeah. yeah Is so. Season of a Witch one of the uh, Romero's like an influence on it? Because aesthetically, when I saw the trailer, it's like, oh, it kind of mm, looks like that. I would really. say it's part of the lineage okay. of the Love Witch just because Season of the Witch is very much about a woman being liberated from yeah. something that is not – she doesn't want to be a part of. Right. And I feel like the Love Witch is an extension of that. So I feel like there's like a, a their descendants. They're definitely not aesthetically the same or like topically, but the feeling is the same. Like the general feeling behind uh, it. While I've got your brains here, I do want to ask you about one movie. Uh, I, I once saw. So I grew up on the Ant Timpson cinema because that's where I grew. I grew up in New Zealand. Oh, so I, I didn't got know that. to see. Yeah, so I got to see I, every year of the Incredibly Strange Film Festival, which was his festival. It's the reason he says innovative. I don't or know. However <laughs> you say that. Whatever I say, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the, there was one movie. So earlier on, I was asking you guys for like where the astrologer came from. And he had he had these great guidebooks where he had put like symbols uh, of alligator teeth or whatever happened. You know, yeah. Carnage. He really is a, honestly a master showman, like mm-hmm. really one of the best. I wish he had done some of that here because uh-huh. it's it was before I think Draft House even existed. He was doing crazy shit like mm-hmm. that. Um, but he once showed a movie uh, and he claimed or the claim was that it was found on the Manson Ranch. The only film print of it was found like after the Mansons, long after they'd gone, mm-hmm. uh, been evicted. They had found this one print of the film, and it was psyched by the 4D witch. 
Oh my God, yes. And so I got to see yes. that on, on, on a film print. Oh my God. This is yes. like 15 years ago. And he said, like, it could be, like, I don't think he was saying it's the worst film ever, but it was, it was like, he didn't put it in that terms. Like, he wasn't yeah. saying this is bad. It wasn't a quality thing, but they were putting, like, you know, this is one of the craziest things you'll mm-hmm. ever wa- witness. And I remember going to the set, maybe I was only like 17 or something. Oh, wow. And I just remember it stayed with me forever, but especially the song. I love the song. That's I think somebody so could cover yeah. that. Uh, she comes from the belly of the devil, mm-hmm. bitch, so beware of the 4D witch. So good. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but but that that little bit of lore, mm-hmm. whether it's it's just like uh, Fargo starting based on a true story. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether it fucking is or not. It yeah. added something to my experience of watching a movie. Going, oh yeah, I could totally imagine the Mansons were watching the you know Manson family <laughs> are just sitting around watching this movie on repeat and all the trippy uh, imagery. But that's a movie. I think that might have been a something. It weird. was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh wow. A yep. long time ago. Um, With monster. Ago. It's one of those yep. films yeah. where every year I'll go online and look see if there's a poster in existence. You know, and just search yeah. and see nothing. There's well, never anything. But um, Lee. Lisa, it's something weird in her paper archive of something where they have all of the materials for that movie. They have the poster and the press kit, and the press kit's uh, amazing oh, because wow. they're actually trying to sell that as like uh, a horror movie. Yeah, it's no, incredible it's, that yeah, they're doing that. Yeah, it's weird sex magic and like it's, acid trippy it's photography. Nuts. Yeah, and the whole thing looks like it was actually transferred on someone's bedroom wall, and yeah. they were filming like the projector projecting <laughs> on a bedroom wall. It looks so otherworldly. I wonder whose crazy. print it was back then. The ant would have been screened because it was like a perfect print. Like yeah, just in a, you know. there's actually a couple prints out there. Okay. Like uh, it was, yeah, it's been, there's like at least three that I know of, which is crazy. Well, please, think, uh, whatever happens, please let me introduce this movie if it ever plays in LA. Mm-hmm. Br- uh, Br- yeah. <laughs> let's make that happen. Just because like, my, my brain will be wow. blown to see it again. Yeah. And for anyone that's listening, it's definitely not for human beings. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is far beyond. That's why I've chosen tonight to reveal my true wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's actually something that I want... I kind of want to change the public opinion about movies like that. Yeah. You know, they're not for human beings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in the past, films like that have always been considered like the hard stuff or the the real horror yeah. junkie or the exploitation junkie. I've been we've been having these conversations about yeah. reframing it so it's not trash, but it's actually for connoisseurs. It's like a mm-hmm. great Poupon moment <laughs> where like. Have you seen the Soul Tangler? <laughs> yeah. I've got the Soul Tangler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 opening up the base of people who could potentially be interested in them by saying, uh, "This is for." People with finer tastes. Well, right. I, I endorse that as someone who was psyched by the 4D witch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I endorse this idea. <laughs> and I, I also feel like the world's ready, more yeah. ready than they ever have been yeah. for things like that. Because I think one of the great things about the internet and Twitter is that it's brought people together who have previously not felt comfortable talking about these things with other people because yeah. people look down on it for so many years. And I think now the world is there's so what we're finding out is a lot of the work that you guys are doing on your show. You know, it's like you find out there's so many people that have a love for these things. And it's like you don't feel alone. It's like like Bat Pussy to me is, is a movie I never would have told my parents that Agfa is releasing. Like, Mom and Dad, I'm working on this softcore porn movie. It's one of the first porn parodies in the world. You know, to be like, oh, God, I'm not going to tell my parents. But now I'm, like, proud of it. Yeah. And I feel like it's because I feel like there's other people out there that are going to accept it for what it is. And, like, Brett's exactly right. I mean, that's part of Agfa's mission, too. It's that saying, like, hey, you guys aren't alone. Like, we're, we're here, too. <laughs> totally. like, we should love this stuff. And it's a collective is. experience that you want to continue. And these are movies that a lot of them probably were never really experienced. Mm-hmm. collectively they're yeah. probably just experienced you know on, on a vhs tape and that's mm-hmm. it so to actually get people in a room it, it, it people will never understand unless you can make it to a screening someday and, and the times i've gotten to a draft house it, it definitely has that uh, you know Cinefamily family new beverly in la have these kind of feelings but if you to see something like whether it's abby when we saw abby oh god that was magic you know that that really was <laughs> special like yeah. that's not like oh it's so funny and because it's bad no no no, oh, no 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 this is a great movie and we're laughing because it's incredible and, and that because is, it's yes. ripping off it's it's because, ripping off something, but it's doing it in a, it's a whole nother movie. Yeah, it's because you your know? mind can't process it. So you laugh. It's like you laugh at things like you laugh in the face of trauma. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. the same thing. It's That's like true. and all that stuff about so bad it's good. It's like burn that shit to the ground. It's yeah. like there's no room for it in the yeah, world yeah. anymore. It's yeah. like over. Well, it's just forget. the wrong way to put it. It is. It's that yeah. it's so crazy it's good. It's yeah. so crazy yeah. it's yeah. great. That's it's, why it's so great, yeah. you know. Uh, but yeah, which leads me it. to one more title, yeah. um, okay. which I bought a prop for. Oh, Whoa. shit. Oh, boy. So, um, and this one's accessible. Um, 1967's The Acid Eaters, which I love so uh-huh. much I own the novelization Whoa. for. Yeah, I, novelization. Have, I have that too. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. Nerds unite. Um, nerds, go. <laughs> um, so this one you can find through something weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, this was one for me that I feel like time really just kind of overlooked. Everyone remembers Roger Corman's The Trip and mm-hmm, some of yeah. the other drug exploitation films. But The Acid Eaters for me is where it's at because the movie is like, it's not made for, you know, normal minds to consume and mm-hmm. nothing makes 
sense in it. And it's not supposed to because it is supposed to be about literally a group of like office workers who go to a pyramid um, in the middle of nowhere and decide to take acid. And then like some of them die, but come back. One of them dresses up as a devil. There's a whole bunch of like weird motorcycle trike action in there. Um, everyone's naked. <laughs> Yep. And it's absolutely This is amazing. officially my favorite episode because I'm just looking at pornography <laughs> while she's talking. Yeah, like it's she's literally, literally passed me a book of pornography. I'm just sitting there going, <laughs> pornography, this is great. So, um, yeah, the acid eaters and the drug exploitation genre. Like, you guys know me from the nunsploitation films um, being one of my favorite of the exploitation. And I thought about bringing my, like, school of the holy beast killer nun type films. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, like, the drug exploitation stuff is definitely one that I've absolutely loved as well and does not get nearly as much love as it should there are so many out there that people have overlooked from like the weed people and just there's many so but the acid eaters if you're going to start somewhere head to acid eaters acid eaters great and lisa from something weird had the best um way to sum up the acid eaters and she said it's like your grandpa making an lsd movie it really is (laughs) it really because you watch it and like you can picture your mom in it because they're not supposed to be like crazy teens they actually posit them as like these are standard office workers who are traveling to this area to do acid for the weekend (laughs) and they really do posit it as like normal Normal people. They could be your mom and dad. And then like five minutes later, they're naked and one of them's missing a head and the devil is there. And yeah, it gets crazy. So and piggybacking on that. Have you seen the weird world of LSD? I have not seen this one. You should write that down. No. Okay. It's, it's another good. like grandpa making drug exploitation <laughs> movie. It's just like, you know, what he thinks that it's like what the kids are doing on drugs. Now, one of my favorite other um, exploitation subgenres that we haven't talked a lot about on this show because they don't tend to fall into horror is Mondo films. Yeah. Um, oh. But there's like there's one um, that's just on New York City that is absolutely crazy. I wore the shirt for one of my favorite ones last week, Sex, sex Rituals of the Occult. Uh-huh. Yes, um, you got compliments I on that did. Shirt. Somebody actually <laughs> oh, knew wow. what it was. I've worn that shirt so many times and everybody's like, What does that mean? And I'm like, it's a movie, 1970, you know, and never mind. Um, But yeah, I love some of like the weird baddie Mondo films that are like now impossible to find. Everyone just knows like Mondo, Kane, and then it goes straight to Faces of Death. Mm -hmm. Um, And then all the Faces of Death knockoffs. But there was some really fascinating ones that came out in the 70s. Were any of you at the Cinefamily Faces of Death screening? With the director Q and A, no, but I've no. heard I've heard it's crazy. Oh, that was one of my favorite memories. Yeah. There's two of them, right? Like a man Weird and a woman. Weird world of LSD. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, it or is was, it just the guy? It's just the guy, uh-huh. and uh, he had never done a Q and A before. And I'm just remembering it. It's just a fun night. They had they had a weird YouTube channel like where they just reviewed movies and it's just super bizarre the face huh. of death director on this weird and and it's like Whoa. mainstream movies it just <laughs> nothing about it felt right it was it kind of made me more uneasy about the whole thing wow well, the documentary so cool. on the blu-ray uh-huh. of the making of faces of death oh, is amazing. which is oh. so meta yeah. you can't it's, even comprehend oh, I gotta, i've got to watch that yeah, yeah it's actually, i liked it better than the yeah yeah well, <laughs> actual movie but yeah yeah i don't know if you're wild. meant to enjoy it i don't know maybe did you so guys how did the q a go was it was it just bizarre it or? was bizarre and incredibly revealing he he uh, didn't want to hold anything back about what he thought about the movie or his intentions. So he had really in, sincere intentions when he made uh, the movie. Wow. Now, was he the one who played the doctor? I can't even doctor G- B. Grossom or something no, like no. that. I, for some reason, I always thought that that was the director. Uh, no, the guy, the guy who made it at the time, he was probably in 30 when he directed oh, it. Wow. So he was like a young guy who wanted to break into the business and somehow got that gig. It was made for the Japanese market, as I recall. Wow. Wow. That somehow just, makes sense because that would have hit like right after the the um, end of the guinea pig series. So that makes sense that that would kind of been like the aesthetic then. I love Mondo movies. Mm-hmm. There's some of my favorites. Have you have you done The Killing of America? Yeah, we've oh, talked yeah. about that quite yeah. a bit. Oh, man. Yeah. That, that was a big one growing up for that, me. That might be my favorite. It, my it's an ama- favorite. And right now there's periods of America like the last eight years where I it felt – far away mm. that documentary oh, no, and the yeah. current political climate might be it's almost like a direct lineage to where we're at it's no, almost like no, oh, totally. see see well, how you, it connects it's kind of disturbing that elric sense. brought it up on the show a while back and i bought an import of it because at the yeah. time that was the only way we can get it and for some reason i was just scared to watch it i'm scared I'm, to watch it i, I like horror movies it. but when it comes to real life violence i'm a i'm a, a scaredy cat about oh, it. I cry. me too i can't yeah. Yeah. I, I can't do it yeah severin did that uh was it yes yeah, severin, yeah, severin yeah. did that amazing blu-ray and literally it arrived on election night and that is what me and my oh. roommate watched wow and we were just like looking at each other like this could not have come at a, a more appropriate time 
uh, even more so now. This but it's week great because busy, you also but... do learn when you see all those things connection, and you you know there, there, there'll be ways out of this. But it's not as bleak as all that. But it is it is really interesting to see because it's like a highlight reel of doom. Oh my know? god! Yeah. Of a, but it, but it kind of at least means you understand how it was connected in a sense. And without that, I think it's yeah. I don't know. I think that piece was is a really special piece of like filmmaking. I don't know anything about the person who made it though. There's some stuff on the okay. on the Blu-ray if I remember correctly. Huh. Yeah. There's a really good book on Mondo Films, which the name is escaping me right now but it was part of that um not jack Sargent. i can't remember his name but it was the recreation books that came out in the 90s is anyone else remember yeah it's uh i know the one you're talking about yeah i uh, I can't remember the name of it it but it was there was a really good book that came out in the late 90s on mondo Uh films that like documented all of them and it was part of the series yeah a whole series of really good books most of which i have i just oh yeah 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 Yeah. called death Death something yeah death i can't remember what it's called death trip no, death tripping, tripping. Was about, death tripping. No, yeah, death, death tripping. Death tripping. Um, death That's tripping was about the rise of the punk films, oh, like okay. Nick Zed's films and okay. things like that. That was the death tripping, tripping one. But it's the same series. Same series, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how can people like support? Because I, I have already t- told you, I, I started really cool T-shirts of American Genre Film Archive on on the Mondo site mm-hmm. and um, like a hat and like are there are there ways to like support the idea of this besides just buying the films or uh it, to tell the person who runs your local cinema to play more genre movies mm. because uh, one of the great things about this new act for program is bringing genre movies to venues which had previously never played them mm. and having a more even playing field venue wise for where something where reanimator could live yeah you know so maybe like a little grassroots if you're in a town that doesn't play that stuff but you know enough people who might be into it get together and go make an argument yeah. to your local theater. Mm-hmm. And actually, I mean, if you want to directly help ACFA, it's yeah. a nonprofit. So there's a donate button on oh, the cool. site at AmericanGenreFilm.com. AmericanGenreFilm.com. And yeah, you can um, you can donate to ACFA. Does mm-hmm. buying merch uh, donate the money back to ACFA? Or? Yes. Okay, cool. And it is called Killing for Culture, Death Films from Mondo to Snuff. It is Creation Books, and it's by David Slater. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think we have just the right uh, audience for all of this, uh, to be honest. So I think, you know, hopefully you guys will be interested to at least look it up and see mm-hmm. what they're doing. Yeah. I think effects will probably be on a lot of people's radars already, like to be looking that one up. So right. maybe dig around when you're on the site and see what they're up to. It's kind of exciting. Yeah. And yeah, hopefully thanks. we'll be seeing, you know, Alamo Draft House in L.A. one day and <laughs> all of this will all culminate and we'll get to go to screenings like this. Uh, maybe you'll get to pick them. Hey, uh, if, if it's psyched by the 4D witch, go. sign me up. <laughs> we can make that happen whenever you want. Okay. Just let us know. Oh, that's magric. Yep. Wow. Pro- though I'm scared to rewatch. I don't oh, don't be. It gets better because you start to notice details okay. that weren't uh, there before. I'm taking you guys to that one. Yeah. Me. Uh, thanks for coming on. It's really it's yeah. really fun. I love I love talking to people who've seen stuff that we haven't. That's, yeah, yeah. After really years of doing that. this, it really it actually is refreshing. Too. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. A lot of great uh, recommendations. Have you done Wolf Guy yet? Wolf Guy? You mean Wolf guy, guy. The film Wolf or guy. Wolf Guy with uh-huh. Sonny Chiba? Oh, uh, no. There's oh some other Sonny God. Chiba films Wolf that we've guy. discussed, yeah. but we have not <laughs> yeah. seen wow. Wolf Guy. Wow. Okay. Uh, where to begin with Wolf Guy? Holy shit. Well, he, oh, he's a reporter who happens to be from a lost lycanthrope tribe, and he's the uh-huh. last of his tribe, but he's a reporter in, in Tokyo, and he discovers a glam rock gang being terrorized by thugs. They're being murdered. This glam rock band is being murdered one by one by a tiger spirit. <laughs> and then Sonny Chiba is kidnapped by the mob in a Cronenbergian testing facility to harness his tiger wolf power, and then in the finale, he's unleashed to unleash his wolf power. It's and one of the most off chart off the charts films. Things. It's another arrow. Film. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the, okay. The, the full title wolf guy enraged lycanthrope. Yes. <laughs> now, do you guys Nocturna? Oh, with uh, with brother Theodore Nocturna. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah the do you Nocturna? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Of course. Okay. What? Nocturna, yeah. 1979. Really oh. hard to find. I have a bootleg. If you guys want to borrow it. Um, Isn't there a new movie that came out right now called Nocturne? Yeah. It's Nocturama. Anyway, it's a oh. dance. It's a disco <laughs> vampire movie about Dracula's granddaughter with Brother Theodore, and yeah. it's in New York City, and they stole every fucking shot. And all oh, crazy. Great oh, wow. soundtrack. He plays our, like the Renfield. He's like, yeah. Yeah, our, uh, our coworker, Christina Cacioppo, who is a creative director at Alamo Draft House in Brooklyn, tracked down the woman who stars as Nocturna. She right. moved back to the Middle East and became like a wasn't she some type of royalty? I could be wrong. Really? On that one. Yeah. I and so she's that, back in New York now. Oh, seriously? Then yeah. maybe she was wow. not Middle Eastern royalty. Yeah. But yeah. 
All right. Well, lots to look forward to. Yes. Yep. <laughs> and, and, and thank you guys so much for oh, having yeah. us. Oh, really, thank really you. Fun. Thank we, you. We only spread the word that we love. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming, and uh, and thank good trip back to Austin. Thank you. <laughs> See you soon. Take care.